Chapter One. No governess, thank you. Do you know it's May the fifth already? Said Jack in a very gloomy voice. All the fellows will be back at school today. What a pity! What a pity! Said Kiki the parrot in just as gloomy a voice as Jack's. This awful measles," said Lucy Ann. First Philip had it as soon as he came home for the holes. Then Dinah. Then she gave it to me, and then you had it. Well, we're all out of quarantine now," said Dinah from her corner of the room. "It's just silly of the doctor to say we ought to go away and have a change before we go back to school. Isn't it enough change to go back to school? I do so love the summer term too. Yes, and I bet I'd have been in the first eleven," said Philip, pushing back the tuft of hair he had in front. "Golly, I'll be glad to get my hair cut again." It feels tickly now. It's grown so long. The four children had all had a bad attack of measles in the holidays. Jack especially had had a very nasty time, and Dinah's eyes had given her a lot of trouble. This was partly her own fault, for she had been forbidden to read and had disobeyed the doctor's orders. Now her eyes kept watering, and she blinked in any bright light. Certainly, no schoolwork for Dinah yet, the doctor had said sternly. I suppose you thought you knew better than I did, young lady, when you disobeyed orders. Think yourself lucky if you don't have to wear glasses a little later on. I hope Mother won't send us away to some awful boarding house by the sea," said Dinah. "She can't come with us herself because she's taken on some kind of important job for the summer. I hope she doesn't get us a governess or something to take us away." "A governess," said Philip in scorn. "I jolly well wouldn't go." And anyway, she wouldn't stay now that I'm training young rats. His sister Dinah looked at him in disgust. Philip always had some kind of creature about him, for he had a great love of animals. He could do anything he liked with them, and Lucy Ann secretly thought that if he met a roaring tiger in a jungle, he would simply hold out his hand, and the tiger would lick it like a dog and purr happily like a cat. I've told you, Philip, that if you so much as let me see one of your young rats, I'll scream," Dinah said. "All right then, scream," said Philip obligingly. "Hey, Squeaker, where are you?" Squeaker appeared above the neck of Philip's jersey collar, and true to his name, squeaked loudly. Dinah screamed, "You beast, Philip! How many of those things have you got down your neck? If we had a cat, I'd give them all to her." Well, we haven't," said Philip, and poked Squeaker's head down his collar again. Three blind mice," remarked Kiki the parrot with great interest, cocking her head on one side and watching for Squeaker to appear again. "Wrong, Kiki, old bird," said Jack, lazily putting out a hand and pulling at his parrot's tail feathers. "Far from being three blind mice, it's one very wide awake rat. I say, Kiki, why didn't you catch measles from us?" Kiki was quite prepared to have a conversation with Jack. She gave a loud cackle and then put her head down to be scratched. How many times have I told you to shut the door? She cried. How many times have I told you to wipe your feet? Wipe the door. Shut your feet. Wipe the. Hey, you're getting muddled," said Jack, and the others laughed. It was always comical when Kiki mixed up the things she loved to say. The parrot liked to make people laugh. She raised her head, put up her crest. And made a noise like a mowing machine outside in the garden. That's enough," said Jack, tapping her on the beak. "Now stop it, Kiki." But Kiki, pleased with the noise, flew up to the top of the curtains and went on being a mowing machine, one that wanted oiling. Mrs. Mannering put her head in at the door. "Children, don't let Kiki make such a noise. I'm interviewing someone, and it's very annoying." "Who's come for an interview?" said Philip at once. Mother, you haven't gone and got a governess or something awful to take us away for a change, have you? Is she here? Yes, she is," said Mrs. Mannering. All the children groaned. "Well, dears, you know I can't spare the time to take you myself," she went on. "I've taken on this new job, though of course, if I'd known you were going to be measly for so long and then be so peaky afterwards, we're not peaky," said Philip indignantly. What an awful word! Peaky squeaky," said Kiki at once, and cackled with laughter. 
She loved putting the same sounding words together. Peaky Squeaky? Shut up, Kiki, called Jack and threw a cushion at her. Aunt Allie, we can quite well go away by ourselves. We're old enough to look after ourselves perfectly. Jack, as soon as I let you out of my sight in the holidays, you plunge into the middle of the most hair-raising adventures, said Mrs. Mannering. I shan't forget what happened in the last summer holidays. Going off in the wrong aeroplane and being lost for ages in a strange valley. Oh, that was a marvellous adventure, cried Philip. I wish we could have another. I'm fed up with being measly so long. Do, do let us go away by ourselves, mother. There's a darling. No, said his mother. You're going to a perfectly safe seaside spot with a perfectly safe governess for a perfectly safe holiday. Safe, 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 shrieked Kiki. Sound and safe, sound and safe. Other way round, Kiki, said Jack. Mrs. Mannering put her fingers to her ears. That bird! I suppose I'm tired with nursing you all, but honestly, Kiki gets dreadfully on my nerves just now. I shall be glad when she's gone with you. I bet no governess will like Kiki, said Jack. Aunt Helly, have you told her about Kiki? Not yet, admitted Mrs. Mannering. But I suppose I'd better bring her in and introduce her to you all and to Kiki, too. She went out. The children scowled at one another. I knew it would happen. Instead of having fun at school, we shall mope about with somebody we can't bear, said Dinah gloomily. Phil, can't you do something with those awful rats of yours when she comes in? If she knew you were the kind of boy that likes mice and rats and beetles and hedgehogs living down his neck and in his pockets, she'd probably run for miles. Jolly good idea, Dinah, said everyone at once, and Philip beamed at her. It's not often you get a brainwave, he said, but that one's all right. Hey, Squeaker, come along out. Waffles, where are you? Nosy, come out of my pocket. Dinah retreated to the furthest corner of the room, watching the young white rats in horror. However many had Philip got? She determined not to go near him if she could possibly help it. I think Kiki might perform also, said Jack, grinning. Kiki? Puff, puff, puff. That was the signal for the parrot to do her famous imitation of a railway engine screeching in a tunnel. She opened her beak and swelled out her throat in delight. It wasn't often that she was begged to make this fearful noise. Lucy Ann put her hands to her ears. The door opened and Mrs. Mannering came in with a tall, rather stern-looking woman. It was quite plain that no adventure, nothing unusual, would ever be allowed to happen anywhere near Miss Lawson. Perfectly safe was written all over her. Children, this is Miss Lawson, began Mrs. Mannering, and then her voice was drowned in Kiki's railway engine screech. It was an even better imitation than usual and longer drawn out. Kiki was really letting herself go. Miss Lawson gave a gasp and took a step backwards. At first she did not see Kiki, but looked at the children, thinking that one of them must be making the terrible noise. Kiki! thundered Mrs. Mannering, really angry. Children, how could you let her? I'm ashamed of you. Kiki stopped. She put her head on one side and looked cheekily at Miss Lawson. Wipe your feet, she commanded. Shut the door. Where's your handkerchief? How many times have I told you to take Kiki out, Jack? said Mrs. Mannering, red with annoyance. I am so sorry, Miss Lawson. Kiki belongs to Jack, and she isn't usually so badly behaved. I see, said Miss Lawson, looking very doubtful. I'm not very much used to parrots, Mrs. Mannering. I suppose, of course, that this bird will not come away with us. I could not be responsible for pets of that kind, and I don't think that a boarding house... Well, uh, we can discuss that later said Mrs. Mannering hastily. Jack, did you hear what I said? Take Kiki out. Polly, put the kettle on, said Kiki to Miss Lawson, who took absolutely no notice at all. Kiki growled like a very fierce dog, and Miss Lawson looked startled. Jack caught the parrot, winked at the others, and took Kiki out of the room. What a pity, what a pity, mourned Kiki as the door shut behind them. Mrs. Mannering gave a sigh of relief. Jack and Lucy Ann Trent are not my own children, 
she said to Miss Lawson. Lucy Ann, shake hands with Miss Lawson. Lucy Ann and her brother are great friends of my own children, and they live with us, and all go off to boarding school together, she explained. Miss Lawson looked at the green eyed, red haired little girl and liked her. She was very like her brother, she thought. Then she looked at Philip and Dinah, each dark eyed and dark haired, with a queer tuft that stuck up in front. She would make them brush it down properly, thought Miss Lawson. Dinah came forward politely and shook hands. She thought that Miss Lawson would be very proper, very strict, and very dull. But oh, so safe. Then Philip came forward, but before he could shake hands, he clutched at his neck. Then he clutched at one leg of his shorts. Then he clapped a hand over his middle. Miss Lawson stared at him in amazement. Excuse me, it's only my rats, explained Philip. And to Miss Lawson's enormous horror, she saw Squeaker running round his collar, Nosy making a lump here and there over his tummy, and Waffles coming out of his sleeve. Goodness, how many more had the awful boy got? I'm sorry, said Miss Lawson faintly. I, I, I'm very sorry, but I can't take this post, Mrs. Mannering. I really can't. Chapter Two A Glorious Idea. After Miss Lawson had hurriedly said goodbye to Mrs. Mannering, and the front door had shut after her, Mrs. Mannering came back into the children's playroom looking very cross. That was too bad of you, really. I feel very annoyed and angry. How could you let Kiki behave like that, Jack? And Philip, there was no need at all for you to make those rats all appear at once. But, Mother, argued Philip, I can't go away without my rats, so it was only fair to let Miss Lawson know what she was in for. I mean, I was really being very honest, and you were being most obstructive, said Mrs. Mannering crossly, and you know you were. I consider you are all being really unhelpful. You know you can't go back to school yet. You all look thin and pale, and you really must pick up first. And I'm doing my best to give you a good holiday in the care of somebody responsible. Sorry, Aunt Allie, said Jack, seeing that Mrs. Mannering really was upset. You see, it's the kind of holiday we'd hate. We're too big to be chivied about by Miss Lawson. Now, if it was old Bill. Old Bill! Everyone brightened up at the thought of old Bill Smuggs. His real name was Cunningham, but as he had introduced himself as Bill Smuggs in their very first adventure, Bill Smuggs he remained. What adventures they had had with him! Golly, yes! If we could go away with Bill! said Philip, rubbing Squeaker's nose affectionately. Yes, and dive into the middle of another dreadful adventure! said Mrs. Mannering. I know Bill. Oh no, Aunt Halley! It's us children who have the adventures and drag old Bill into them, said Jack. Really it is. But we haven't heard from Bill for ages and ages. This was true. Bill seemed to have disappeared off the map. He hadn't answered the children's letters. Mrs. Mannering hadn't heard a word. He was not at his home and hadn't been there for weeks. But nobody worried much about him. Bill was always on secret and dangerous missions and disappeared for weeks at a time. Still, this time he had really been gone for ages without a word to anyone. Never mind, he would suddenly turn up ready for a holiday, grinning all over his cheerful, ruddy face. If only he would turn up now, this very afternoon. That would be grand. Nobody would mind missing the glorious summer term for a week or two if only they could go off with Bill. But no bill came, and something had to be decided about this holiday. Mrs. Mannering looked at the mutinous children in despair. I suppose, she said suddenly, I suppose you wouldn't like to go off to some place somewhere by the sea where you could study the wild seabirds and their nesting habits. I know Jack has always wanted to, but it has been impossible before, because you were all at school at the best time of the year for it. And. Aunt Ally! Yelled Jack, beside himself with joy. That's the most marvelous idea you've ever had in your life. Oh, I say. Yes, mother, it's gorgeous, agreed Philip, rapping on the table to emphasize his feelings. Kiki at once rapped with her beak, too. Come in, 
she ordered solemnly, but no one took any notice. This new idea was too thrilling. Lucy Ann always loved to be where her brother Jack was, so she beamed too, knowing how happy Jack would be among his beloved birds. Philip, too, lover of animals and birds, could hardly believe that his mother had made such a wonderful suggestion. Only Dinah looked blue. She was not fond of wild animals, and was really scared of most of them, though she was better than she had been. She liked birds, but hadn't the same interest and love for them that the boys had. Still, to be all by themselves in some wild, lonely place by the sea, wearing old clothes, doing what they liked, picnicking every day, what joy! So Dinah began to smile too, and joined in the cheerful hullabaloo. Can we really go all by ourselves? When? Do say when. Tomorrow. Can't we go tomorrow? Golly, I feel better just at the thought of it. Mother, whatever made you think of it? Honestly, it's wizard. Kiki sat on Jack's shoulder, listening to the babble of noise. The rats hidden about Philip's clothes burrowed deeply for safety, scared of such a sudden outburst of voices. Give me a chance to explain," said Mrs. Mannering. "There's an expedition setting out in two days' time for some of the lonely coasts and islands off the north of Britain. Just a few naturalists and one boy, the son of Doctor Johns, the ornithologist. All the children knew what an ornithologist was, one who loved and studied birds and their ways. Philip's father had been a bird lover. He was dead now, and the boy often wished he had known him. For he was very like him in his love for all wild creatures. Doctor Johns said, "Philip, why that was one of Daddy's best friends." Yes, said his mother. I met him last week, and he was telling me about this expedition. His boy is going, and he wondered if there was any chance of you and Dinah going, Philip. You weren't at all well then, and I said no at once. But now, but now we can," cried Philip, giving his mother a sudden hug. Fancy you thinking of somebody like Miss Lawson when you knew about this? How could you? Well, it seems a long way for you to go," said Mrs. Mannering, "and it wasn't exactly the kind of holiday I had imagined for you. Still, if you think you'd like it, I'll ring up Doctor Johns and arrange for him to add four more to his bird expedition if he can manage it. Of course, he'll be able to manage it," cried Lucy Ann. "We shall be company for his boy too, Aunt Ally." I say, won't it be absolutely lovely to be up so far north in this glorious early summer weather? The children felt happy and cheerful that tea time as they discussed the expedition. To go exploring among the northern islands, some of them only inhabited by birds, to swim and sail and walk and watch hundreds, no, thousands of wild birds in their daily lives. There'll be puffins up there," said Jack happily. "Thousands of them." They go there in nesting time. I've always wanted to study them. They're such comical-looking birds. Puff, puff, puffin," said Kiki at once, thinking it was an invitation to let off her railway engine screech. But Jack stopped her sternly. "No, Kiki, no more of that. Frighten the gulls and cormorants, the guillemots and the puffins, all you like, with that awful screech when we get to them. But you are not to let it off here. It gets on Aunt Ally's nerves. What a pity! What a pity!" Said Kiki mournfully, "Puff, puff, ch, 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 idiot," said Jack, and ruffled the parrot's feathers. She sidled towards him on the tea table and rubbed her beak against his shoulder. Then she pecked a large strawberry out of the jar of jam. "Oh, Jack," began Mrs. Mannering, "you know I don't like Kiki on the table at meal times, and really, that's the third time she's helped herself to strawberries out of the jam. Put it back, Kiki." Ordered Jack at once, but that didn't please Mrs. Mannering either. Really, she thought it would be very nice and peaceful when the four children and the parrot were safely off on their holiday. The children spent a very happy evening talking about the coming holiday. The next day, Jack and Philip looked out of their field glasses and cleaned them up. Jack hunted for his camera, a very fine one indeed. I shall take some unique pictures of the puffins, he told Lucy Ann. I hope they'll be nesting when we get there, Lucy Ann. Though I think we might be a bit too early to find eggs. Do they nest in trees? Asked Lucy Ann. Can you take pictures of their nests too, and the puffins sitting on them? Jack smiled. Puffins don't nest in trees, he explained. 
They nest in burrows underground. Gracious, said Lucy Ann, like rabbits. Well, they even take rabbit burrows for nesting places sometimes, said Jack. It will be fun to see puffins scuttling underground to their nests. I bet they will be as tame as anything too, because on some of these bird islands, nobody has ever been known to set foot. So the birds don't know enough to fly off when people arrive. You could have puffins for pets easily, then," said Lucy Ann. "I bet Philip will. I bet he'll only just have to whistle, and all the puffins will come huffing and puffing to meet him." Everyone laughed at Lucy Ann's comical way of putting things. "Huffing and puffing," said Kiki, scratching her head. "Huffing and puffing, poor little piggy wiggy pig." Now what's she talking about?" said Jack. Kiki, you do talk a lot of rubbish. Poor little piggy wiggy pig," repeated Kiki solemnly, huffing and puffing, huffing and. Philip gave a shout of laughter. I know, she's remembered hearing the tale of the wolf and the three little pigs. Don't you remember how the wolf came huffing and puffing to blow their house down? <laughs> oh, Kiki, you're a marvel. She'll give the puffins something to think about," said Dinah. "Won't you, Kiki?" They'll wonder what sort of a freak has come to visit them. Hello, is that the telephone bell? Yes," said Jack, thrilled. Aunt Ally has put through a call to Doctor Johns to tell him we'll join his expedition, but he was out, so she asked for him to ring back when he got home. I bet that's his call. The children crowded out into the hall where the telephone was. Mrs. Mannering was already there. The children pressed close to her, eager to hear everything. Hello. Said Mrs. Mannering, "Is that Doctor Johns? Oh, it's Mrs. Johns. Yes, Mrs. Mannering here. What's that? Oh, oh, I'm so dreadfully sorry. How terrible for you. Oh, I do so hope it isn't anything serious. Yes, yes, of course, I quite understand. He will have to put the whole thing off till next year, perhaps. Well, I do hope you'll have good news soon." You'll be sure to let us know, won't you? Goodbye. She hung up the receiver and turned to the children with a solemn face. I'm so sorry, children, but Doctor Johns has been in a car accident this morning. He's in hospital, so of course, the whole expedition is off. Off. No bird islands after all. No glorious, carefree time in the wild seas of the north. What a terrible disappointment! Chapter Three. Very mysterious. Everyone was upset. They were sorry for Mrs. Johns, of course, and for her husband, but as they didn't know them at all, except as old friends of Mr. Mannering long ago, the children felt far, far more miserable about their own disappointment. We talked about it such a lot, and made such plans, and got everything ready," groaned Philip. Looking sadly at the field glasses hanging nearby in their brown leather cases, now mother will look for another Miss Lawson. No, I won't," said Mrs. Mannering. "I'll give up my new job and take you away myself. I can't bear to see you so disappointed, poor things. No, darling Aunt Ally, you shan't do that," said Lucy Ann, flinging herself on Mrs. Mannering. "We wouldn't let you. Oh dear, whatever can we do?" Nobody knew. It seemed as if their sudden disappointment made everyone incapable of further planning. The bird holiday or nothing. The bird holiday or nothing. That was the thought in all the children's minds. They spent the rest of the day pottering about miserably, getting on each other's nerves. One of their sudden quarrels blew up between Philip and Dinah, and with yells and shouts, they belaboured one another in a way they had not done for at least a year. Lucy Ann began to cry. Jack yelled angrily, "Stop hitting Dinah, Philip! You'll hurt her." But Dinah could give as good as she got, and there was a loud crack as she slapped Philip full across his cheek. Philip caught her hands angrily, and she kicked him. He tripped her up, and down she went on the floor with her brother rolling over and over too. Lucy Ann got out of their way, still crying. Kiki flew up to the electric light and cackled loudly. She thought Philip and Dinah were playing. There was such a noise that nobody heard the telephone bell ringing again. Mrs. Mannering, frowning at the yells and bumps from the playroom, went to answer it. 
Then she suddenly appeared at the door of the playroom, her face beaming. It changed when she saw Dinah and Philip fighting on the floor. Dinah, Philip, get up at once! You ought to be ashamed of yourselves quarrelling like this now that you are so big. I have a good mind not to tell you who that was on the telephone. Philip sat up, rubbing his flaming cheek. Dinah wriggled away, holding her arm. Lucy Ann mopped her tears, and Jack scowled down at the pair on the floor. What a collection of bad-tempered children," said Mrs. Mannering. Then she remembered that they had all had measles badly and were probably feeling miserable and bad-tempered after their disappointment that day. Listen," she said more gently. "Guess who that was on the telephone?" "Mrs. Johns, to say that Doctor Johns is all right after all," suggested Lucy Ann hopefully. Mrs. Mannering shook her head. "No, it was old Bill." Bill, hurrah! So he's turned up again at last," cried Jack. "Is he coming to see us?" "Well, he was very mysterious," said Mrs. Mannering. "Wouldn't say who he was. Just said he might pop in tonight, late, if nobody else was here. Of course, I knew it was Bill. I'd know his voice anywhere." Quarrels and bad temper were immediately forgotten. The thought of seeing Bill again was like a tonic. Did you tell him we'd had measles and were all at home? Demanded Philip. Does he know he'll see us too? No, I hadn't time to tell him anything," said Mrs. Mannering. "I tell you, he was most mysterious. Hardly on the telephone for half a minute. Anyway, he'll be here tonight. I wonder why he didn't want to come if anyone else was here. Because he doesn't want anyone to know where he is. I should think," said Philip. "He must be on one of his secret missions again, Mother." We can stay up to see him, can't we? If he isn't later than half past nine," said Mrs. Mannering. She went out of the room. The four looked at one another. "Good old Bill," said Philip. "We haven't seen him for ages. Hope he comes before half past nine." "Well, I jolly well shan't go to sleep till I hear him come," said Jack. "Wonder why he was so mysterious." The children expected to see Bill all the evening. And were most disappointed when no car drove up and nobody walked up to the front door. Half past nine came, and no Bill. I'm afraid you must all go to bed," said Mrs. Mannering. "I'm sorry, but really you all look so tired and pale. That horrid measles! I do feel so sorry that that expedition is off. It would have done you all the good in the world." The children went off to bed grumbling. The girls had a bedroom at the back. And the boys at the front. Jack opened the window and looked out. It was a dark night. No car was to be heard, nor any footsteps. I shall listen for Bill, he told Philip. I shall sit here by the window till he comes. You get into bed. I'll wake you if I hear him. We'll take it in turns," said Philip, getting into bed. "You watch for an hour, then wake me up, and I'll watch." In the back bedroom, the girls were already in bed. Lucy Ann wished she could see Bill. She loved him very much. He was so safe and strong and wise. Lucy Ann had no father or mother, and she often wished that Bill was her father. Aunt Allie was a lovely mother, and it was nice to share her with Philip and Dinah. She couldn't share their father because he was dead. I hope I shall keep awake and hear Bill when he comes, she thought. But soon she was fast asleep, and so was Dinah. The clock struck half past ten, and then eleven. Jack woke Philip. Nobody has come yet, he said. Your turn to watch, Tufty. Funny that he's so late, isn't it? Philip sat down at the window. He yawned. He listened, but he could hear nothing. And then he suddenly saw a streak of bright light as his mother downstairs pulled back a curtain, and the light flooded into the garden. Philip knew what it was, of course, but he suddenly stiffened as the light struck on something pale hidden in a bush by the front gate. The something was moved quickly back into the shadows, but Philip had guessed what it was. That was someone's face I saw. Somebody is hiding in the bushes by the gate. Why? It can't be Bill. He'd come right in. Then it must be somebody waiting in ambush for him. Golly! He slipped across to the bed and awoke Jack. He whispered to him what he had seen. Jack was out of bed and by the window at once, but he could see nothing. Of course, 
Mrs. Mannering had drawn the curtain back over the window, and no light shone out now. The garden was in darkness. We must do something quickly, said Jack. If Bill comes, he'll be knocked out, if that's what that man there is waiting for. Can we warn Bill? It's plain he knows there's danger for himself, or he wouldn't have been so mysterious on the telephone, and insisted he couldn't come if anyone else was here. I wish Aunt Allie would go to bed. What's the time? The clock struck eleven some time ago, I know. There came the sound of somebody clicking off lights and a door closing. It's Mother, said Philip. She's not going to wait any longer. She's coming up to bed. Good. Now the house will be in darkness, and maybe that fellow will go. We'll have to see that he does, said Jack. Do you suppose Bill will come now, Philip? It's getting very late. If he says he will, he will, said Philip. Shh! Here's Mother. Both boys hopped into bed and pretended to be asleep. Mrs. Mannering switched the light on, and then, seeing that both boys were apparently sound asleep, she switched it off again quickly. She did the same in the girls' room, and then went to her own room. Philip was soon sitting by the window again, eyes and ears open for any sign of the hidden man in the bushes below. He thought he heard a faint cough. He's still there, he said to Jack. He must have got wind of Bill coming here tonight. Or more likely still, he knows that Bill is a great friend of ours, and whatever gang he belongs to has sent a man to watch in that bush every night, said Jack. He's hoping that Bill will turn up sooner or later. Bill must have a lot of enemies. He's always tracking down crooks and criminals. Listen, said Philip. I'm going to creep out of the back door and get through the hedge of the next door garden and out of their back gate so as not to let that hidden man hear me. And I'm going up to watch for old Bill and warn him. He'll come up the road, not down, because that's the way he always comes. Good idea, said Jack. I'll come too. No, one of us must watch to see what the man down there does, said Philip. We'll have to know if he's there or not. I'll go. You stay at the window. If I find Bill coming along, I'll warn him and turn him back. All right, said Jack, wishing he had the exciting job of creeping about the dark gardens to go and meet Bill. Give him our love, and tell him to phone us if he can, and we'll meet him somewhere safe. Philip slipped quietly out of the room. There was still a light in his mother's room, so he went very cautiously downstairs, anxious not to disturb her. She would be very scared if she knew about the hidden man. He opened the back door quietly, shut it softly behind him, and went out into the dark garden. He had no torch, for he did not want to show any sign of himself at all. He squeezed through a gap in the hedge and came into the next door garden. He knew it very well. He found the path and then made his way quietly along the grass at the edge of it, afraid of making the gravel crunch a little if he walked on it. Then he thought he heard a sound. He stopped dead and listened. Surely there wasn't another man hiding somewhere. Could they be burglars, not men waiting for Bill after all? Ought he to creep back and telephone to the police? He listened again, straining his ears, and he had a queer feeling that there was someone nearby, also listening. Listening for him, Philip, perhaps. It was not a nice thought there in the darkness. He took a step forward. And then suddenly someone fell on him savagely, pinned his arms behind him, and forced him on his face to the ground. Philip bit deep into the soft earth of a flower bed and choked. He could not even shout for help. Chapter 4 A Visit from Bill and a Great Idea Philip's captor was remarkably quiet in his movements. He had captured Philip with hardly a sound. And as the boy had not had time to utter a single cry, nobody had heard anything at all. Philip struggled frantically, for he was half choked with the soft earth that his face was buried in. He was twisted over quickly, and a gag of some sort was put right across his mouth. His wrists, he found, were already tied together. Whatever could be happening? Did this fellow think he was Bill? But surely he knew that Bill was big and burly. Trying to spit out the earth in his mouth behind the gag, Philip wriggled and struggled, but it was of no use, for his captor was strong and merciless. He was picked up and carried to a summer house quite silently. And now, hissed a voice close to his ear, how many more of you are there here? Tell me that, or you'll be sorry. 
Grunt twice if there are more of you. Philip made no answer. He didn't know what to do, grunt or not grunt. Instead, he groaned, for his mouth was still full of earth, and it did not taste at all nice. His captor ran his hands over him. Then he got out a small pocket torch and flashed it once, very quickly, on Philip's gagged face. He saw the tuft of hair standing straight up on Philip's forehead and gave a gasp. Philip! You little ass! What are you doing out here creeping about in the dark? With a shock of amazement and delight, Philip recognized Bill's voice. Gosh! So it was Bill! Well, he didn't mind his mouth being full of earth then. He pulled at the gag, making gurgling sounds. Shut up! whispered Bill urgently, and he took off the gag. There may be others about. Don't make a sound. If you've anything to say, whisper it right into my ear like this. Bill! whispered Philip, his mouth finding Bill's ear. There's a man hidden in the bushes at our front gate. We spotted him there, and I slipped out to warn you if I could. Be careful. Bill undid Philip's wrists. The boy rubbed them tenderly. Bill knew how to tie people up, no doubt about that. Good thing he hadn't knocked him out. The back door's open, he whispered into Bill's ear. As far as I know, there's nobody waiting about at the back. Let's try and get into the house. We can talk there. Very silently, the two made their way back to the gap in the hedge that Philip knew so well. Neither of them trod on the gravel, in case the slight crunch might warn any hidden watcher. They squeezed through the gap slowly and carefully. Now they were in Philip's own garden. Taking Bill by the arm, he led him slowly over the dark lawn, under the trees, towards the house. There was no light in it anywhere now. Mrs. Mannering had gone to bed. The back door was still unlocked. Philip pushed it open, and the two of them went in. Don't put on the light, whispered Bill. We don't want anyone to know that we're awake here. I'll lock this door. They went cautiously upstairs. One of the stairs creaked loudly, and Jack, who was waiting in the bedroom, shot at the door. Luckily, he didn't switch the light on. It's all right. It's only me, whispered Philip. And I've got old Bill. Good egg, said Jack in delight, and dragged them into his room. Bill gave his hand a hearty shake. He was very fond of the whole family. I must rinse my mouth out, said Philip. It's full of earth still. I didn't dare to do any spitting out in the garden because of the noise. Ugh, it's horrible. Poor Philip, said Bill remorsefully. I didn't know it was you, old fellow. I thought it was somebody lying in wait for me, and I meant to get him before he got me. You did it jolly well, said Philip, rinsing his mouth out. Now where's my toothpaste? I really must clean my teeth. Oh, blow! His hand, seeking for his toothpaste in the dark, had knocked over a glass. It fell into the basin and smashed. It made a tremendous noise in the silent night. Go and warn the girls not to put their light on if this has woken them, said Bill urgently to Jack. Quick, and see if it has waked Aunt Ally. If it has, warn her too. Lucy Ann was awake, and Jack just managed to stop her switching on the light. His mother did not stir. Her room was further away, and she had not heard the sound of breaking glass. Lucy Ann was astonished to hear Jack's urgent voice. What's up? she asked. Anything gone wrong? Are you or Philip ill? Of course not, said Jack impatiently. Get your dressing gown on and wake Dinah. Bill's here, but we're not to put on any lights, see? Something fluttered by his head with a low squawk. Oh, Kiki, I wondered where you were, said Jack. What made you sleep in the girls' room tonight? Come along and see Bill. Lucianne awoke and astonished Dinah. The two girls put on their dressing gowns and went to the boys' room. Kiki was already there, nibbling Bill's ear in delight, making soft noises in his ear. Hello, hello, said Bill when the girls crept softly into the room. Which is which? I can only feel you. Ah, this must be Lucianne. I can smell your freckles. You can't smell freckles, said Lucianne, giggling. But you're right, it is me all the same. Oh, Bill, where have you been so long? You didn't answer any of our letters at all. I know, said Bill. You see, I was on a peculiar job, hunting down a gang of rogues, and then, before I knew what was happening, 
they got wind of what I was doing and began to hunt me down. So I had to go into hiding and keep dark. Why? Would they have kidnapped you or something, Bill? Asked Lucy Ann, scared. Oh, there's no knowing what they would have done to me, said Bill airily. I should certainly have disappeared for good. But here I am, as you see. So that's what that man at the front gate was there for, hoping to get you, said Philip. Why have you come to see us now, Bill? Do you want us to do anything? Well, said Bill, I've got to disappear for some time, and I wanted to see your mother particularly, to give her a few things to keep for me, just in case, well, just in case I didn't turn up again. I'm what is called a marked man now, as far as this particular gang is concerned. I know too much about them for their own comfort. Oh, Bill, but where are you going to disappear to? asked Lucy Ann forlornly. I don't like you to disappear into the blue. Can't you tell us? Oh, I'll probably lead the simple life somewhere in the wilds, said Bill, till these fellows have given up hunting for me or get themselves caught. I don't want to disappear. Don't think that. I'm not afraid of any of them, but my chiefs can't afford to let anyone get hold of me. So I've got to vanish completely for a time, and not even get into touch with you or my family. There was a silence. It wasn't nice to hear all this, told in a low voice in the darkness of midnight. Lucy Ann groped for Bill's hand. He squeezed her fingers. Cheer up. You'll hear from me again some day. Next year or the year after. I shall take some kind of disguise. Become a miner somewhere in the wilds of Alaska. Or... Or a lonely ornithologist on some desolate island. Or... Jack gave a gasp. Something clicked in his mind as a really brilliant idea slid into place there. Bill! Oh, Bill! I've thought of something grand! Shh! Not so loud, said Bill. And just take Kiki on your shoulder now, will you, before she nibbles away the whole of my left ear. Listen, Bill, said Jack urgently. I've thought of something. We had a great disappointment today. I'll tell you about it first. Go on, then, said Bill. "'thankful that Kiki was no longer on his shoulder. "'I don't expect you know, but we've all had measles pretty badly,' said Jack. "'That's why we're not back at school. "'Well, the doctor said we ought to go away for a change, "'and Aunt Allie decided we could go on a bird-watching expedition "'with Dr. Johns and his party "'to some lonely coasts and islands off the north of Britain. "'You know, places that only birds live on, "'and only bird lovers visit.' "'I know,' said Bill, listening intently. "'Well... Dr. Johns got hurt in an accident today, said Jack, so we can't go because there is nobody to take us. But why can't you take us, disguised as some bird man or other? Then we'd have a perfectly glorious holiday, you'd be able to get off into the unknown without anyone knowing, and we could leave you behind there when we come back, quite safe. There was silence. All the children waited breathlessly for Bill's answer. Even Kiki seemed to be listening anxiously. I don't know, said Bill at last. It's too much like using you as a smoke screen, and if my enemies saw through the smoke, well, things wouldn't be too good for you or for me either. I don't think it's possible. The mere thought of Bill's turning the wonderful idea down made the children more enthusiastic and urgent about it. They each had a few words to contribute. We were so disappointed not to go, and now this does seem a way. And after all, it would only be for about two weeks, as far as we're concerned. We'd be going back to school then. You're awfully good at disguises. You could easily look like an ornithologist. Sort of earnest, and always peering into the distance for birds, and with field glasses over your shoulder. Nobody could possibly know. We'd all be absolutely safe up in the northern seas, so wild and desolate with you. Think of May up there. The sea so blue, the birds all soaring and gliding, the sea pinks out all over the place. You'd be safe, Bill. No one surely would ever dream of hunting for you in a place like that. And, oh, we do want that kind of holiday. We felt mouldy after measles. Not so loud, whispered Bill. I'll have to talk things over with your mother first, even if I think it's all right myself. It's a bold idea. And I don't think it would occur to anyone for one moment that I would go off openly like that. And I must say that a holiday with you four, and Kiki too, of course, 
It's just what I'm needing at the moment. Oh, Bill, I believe you'll do it," said Lucy Ann, hugging him with ecstasy. "What a lovely ending to a horrid day!" Chapter Five: Exciting Plans. Bill spent the night, unknown to Mrs. Mannering, in the little spare room. He said he would talk to her the next morning. He was relieved to find that a daily maid came in each morning, but that no one except the family slept in the house at night. We children do all the beds and things upstairs now that we have recovered," said Dinah. "So you can stay up here unseen if you like. We'll bring breakfast up." But the next morning, everything was upset again. Mrs. Mannering knocked on the wall separating the girls' room from hers, and Dinah went running in to see what the matter was. Dinah, the most sickening thing has happened," said Mrs. Mannering in disgust. "I've got measles now. Look at my spots. I thought I'd had it when I was your age, but it's measles right enough. Oh dear, I wish I had engaged that Miss Lawson and let her take you off to Bournemouth or somewhere yesterday. Now what are we to do?" Oh dear," said Dinah. Then she decided to tell her mother about Bill being there. Perhaps that would help. "I'll get you your dressing jacket and tidy the room," she said briskly. "Because there's someone who wants to see you. He may help quite a lot." "It's Bill." "Bill," said Mrs. Mannering, amazed. "When did he come? I waited up till eleven, but I felt so terribly tired I just had to go to bed. Well now." I wonder if old Bill would take you off my hands for a bit and leave Hilda the daily to look after me. I'm sure he would," said Dinah, delighted. "Poor mother, you feel the worst the first two or three days, and after that it's not so bad. There, are your pillows comfy? I'll send Bill in now." The news was broken to the others. The children were sorry and dismayed. Did grown-ups actually get measles then? Poor mother, poor Aunt Allie. She would certainly want them out of the house now. She's ready to see you, Bill," said Dinah. "I say, I suppose you've had measles all right, haven't you?" "Oh, dozens of times," said Bill cheerfully, going to Mrs. Mannering's room. "Cheer up, we'll get things right in no time." "But you can only have measles once," began Lucy Ann. Then the door was shut, and the children could only hear a murmur of voices in the room. They went down to breakfast. The boys had more or less got back their ordinary appetites, but the girls still only picked at their food. Dinah looked at Lucy Ann. "Your freckles hardly show," she said. "Nor do Jack's. A bit of sun will do us all good." "I don't feel like this bacon, do you?" "Oh dear, I wish Bill would hurry up and come down. I do want to know what they've decided." Bill did not come down. The children heard the door above opening, and then a soft whistle. Bill was evidently afraid the daily was about, but she had gone out to do the shopping. It's all right," called Dinah. "Hilda's out. Come down if you want to. We've saved you some breakfast." Bill came down. "Your mother doesn't want any breakfast except toast and tea," he said. "You make the toast, Dinah. I see the kettle's boiling. We can make tea as soon as the toast is ready." Then I'm going to ring up the doctor, and then ring up Miss Tremaine, your mother's friend, and ask her to come along for a week or two to be with the invalid. She says she'll like that. The children listened in silence. And what about us? Asked Jack at last. Didn't you decide? Yes, I decided," said Bill. Your aunt begged me to take you away for two weeks. And I told her I was due to disappear for a while, so I'd go off to the northern seas with you. I didn't scare her with my reasons for disappearing. She's really feeling bad this morning, and she's so thankful to think you'll get away for a change that she hardly asked me any questions at all. So where to go? Said Jack, unable to keep the joy out of his voice, even though he was very sorry about Aunt Allie. How absolutely super! The four faces glowed. Kiki picked a piece of rind out of the marmalade, and, as nobody said anything, took a piece of lump sugar from the sugar basin. Mother will be quite all right, won't she, with Miss Tremaine? Said Philip earnestly. She wouldn't like one of us to stay with her, would she? I'll stay if so. She would be much better with you all out of the house," said Bill, helping himself to bacon. 
She's tired out and wants a really peaceful time. Measles is beastly, but at least it will make her rest in bed for a while. Well then, we can really look forward to going off with a light heart, said Jack cheerfully. Oh, Bill, you always turn up just exactly at the right moment. Here's Hilda, said Philip suddenly. You'd better hop upstairs, Bill. Take your plate. I'll bring you more toast and tea when we take mothers up. Isn't that toast finished yet, Dinah? Just, said Dinah, and put the last piece in the toast rack. No, Kiki, leave it alone. Oh, Jack, look at Kiki's beak, just dripping with marmalade. There won't be any left for us, greedy bird. Bill disappeared upstairs. Hilda went into the kitchen and began to fill up the kitchen stove. Dinah went out to tell her about Mrs. Mannering having the measles. Hilda was most sympathetic, but looked very worried. Well,、uh, I dare say I can manage, she said. But what with all you children here, too? Oh, but we shan't be, said Dinah. We're going off on a bird expedition as soon as we can, and Miss Tremaine is coming to see to mother, so. Hilda! 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 called a voice. And Hilda jumped. "My, that's the missus calling," she said. "And you told me she was in bed.、Uh, come in, madam." But it was only Kiki, of course, doing one of her imitations. She cackled with laughter when Hilda came running into the dining room. "Wipe your feet," she ordered. "Don't sniff. How many times have I told you to?" Hilda went out and banged the door. "I don't mind taking orders from them as has the right to give 'em." She said to a giggling diner, "But take orders from that ridiculous bird, I will not. I hope, Miss, that you're taking that parrot with you. I don't want the minding of her whilst you're gone. Drive me crazy, she would." "Oh, of course we'll take her," said Diner. "Jack would never dream of going without her." The doctor came. Miss Tremaine arrived. Hilda agreed to sleep in. Everything seemed to be going well. Bill, ensconced in the spare room, whose door he kept locked in case Hilda should come barging in, made a few quick plans. Pack up your things. Order a taxi for eight o'clock tomorrow night. We'll catch the night train to the north. I'll slip out tonight and make the rest of the plans for the journey and the holiday. I'll meet you at Euston, and it won't be as the Bill Smugs you know. I shall then be Doctor Walker. The naturalist. <laughs> I'll come over and introduce myself in a loud voice as soon as I see you arrive, in case there's anyone about that knows you, <laughs> or me either. Then off we'll go. It all sounded very thrilling. What a mysterious way to begin a holiday! It sounded as if they were setting off for a first-class adventure, but of course they weren't. It would be fun if they were, but what could happen on lonely bird islands? Nothing at all except birds and more birds. And yet more birds. Bill slipped off that night. No one had known he was in the house. Not even Miss Tremaine, who had been given the little dressing room leading off Mrs. Mannering's room. Mrs. Mannering had promised not to say that Bill had been there in case it meant danger to him. But she was so heavy and sleepy that day that she really began to wonder if Bill had actually been there at all, or if she had dreamt it. The children packed. No need to take best dresses or anything like that. Shorts and jerseys, rubber shoes, bathing suits and mackintoshes were the things they would want, and a few cardigans, some towels, and what about some rugs? Were they going to sleep under a roof or not? Bill hadn't said. For all they knew, they might be sleeping in tents. What fun! They decided not to take rugs. Bill would be sure to take things like that if they needed them. Field glasses, notebooks. Pencils, my camera, and a rope," said Jack, trying to think of everything. Lucy Ann looked astonished. "A rope," she said. "Why a rope? We might want to go cliff climbing if we want to examine nesting places there," said Jack. "Well, you can go cliff climbing if you like. I shan't," said Lucy Ann with a shiver. "I'd hate to climb down steep cliffs with just a rope round me and hardly anything to put my feet on." Kiki's taken your pencil," said Dinah. "Kiki, don't be such a nuisance. We shan't take you to see the puffins if you behave like this. Huffin and puffin, puffin and huffin, muffin and puffin, muffins and crumpets," pronounced Kiki, and cracked her beak in delight at having said something new. 
Huffing and puff. Oh, stop huffing and puffing, called Dinah. God save the Queen, said Kiki, and stood up very straight. Goodness knows what the birds up there will think of you, said Lucianne. Jack, shall we put her into a basket to take her with us on the train? You know how she will keep shouting, guard, guard, and pretending to blow a whistle and telling everyone to wipe their feet. She can go on my shoulder, said Jack. We shall be sleeping on the train in beds or berths, and she'll be quite all right. Stop cracking your beak, Kiki. It's not clever to keep on making a nuisance of yourself. Naughty Polly, said Kiki. Sing Polly Wally, oodle all the day. Philip threw a cushion at her, and she retired to the top of the curtains and sulked. The children went on discussing their coming holiday. Fancy having the luck to be with Bill after all, said Jack. Much better than Dr. John's. I wonder if he'll have a boat and go exploring round. Golly, I'm going to enjoy the next week or two. We might even see a great orc. You and your great orcs, said Philip. You know quite well they're extinct. Don't start all that again, Jack. We might find little orcs up there, though, and razor bills, and thousands of guillemots on the cliffs. The next day came at last, and then dragged on till the evening. Mrs. Mannering slept most of the time, and Miss Tremaine would not let them go in and wake her to say goodbye. Better not, she said. I'll say goodbye for you. Mind you write to her from wherever you're going. Is that the taxi I hear now? I'll come and see you off. It was the taxi. They bundled in with all their luggage. Now to London, to meet Dr. Walker, and to travel hundreds of miles to the north, to wild places where few people had ever been. No adventures this time, but just a glorious, carefree holiday with old Bill. All aboard, said Kiki in a deep voice that made the taxi driver jump. One, two, three, off! Chapter Six Travelling Far Bill had told the children exactly where to wait for him at Euston Station, so, each carrying a bag and a Macintosh, they went to the spot. They stood there waiting. Suppose, said Philip in a mysterious voice, just suppose that one of the gang that Bill is after knew Bill was going to meet us here and came up and told us he was Bill and took us all off with him so that we were never heard of again. Poor Lucy Ann stared at him in the greatest alarm. Her eyes nearly popped out of her head. Oh, Philip, do you think that might happen? Gracious, I hope to goodness we recognize Bill when we see him. I shall be scared stiff of going with him if we don't. A very fat man approached them, smiling. He was big all over. Big head, big body, big feet, and big teeth that showed when he smiled. Lucianne felt her heart sink. This couldn't be Bill. Nobody could make himself as big as that if he wasn't fat to begin with. She clutched Philip's hand. Was it one of the gang? Little girl, said the big man to Lucianne, you drop your Macintosh behind you. You'll lose it if you don't pick it up. Lucy Ann had gone pale when he first began to speak. Then she looked round and saw her Mac on the ground. She picked it up. Then, scarlet in the face, she stammered out a few words of thanks. The big man smiled again, showing all his fine teeth. Don't look so scared, he said. I shan't eat you. He looks just as if he might, thought Lucy Ann, retreating behind Jack. Pop goes the weasel, said Kiki in a polite conversational tone. Pop, pop, pop. What a remarkably clever bird, said the big man, and put out his hand to pat Kiki. She gave him a vicious nip with her beak, and then whistled like an engine. The big man's smile vanished, and he scowled. Dangerous bird, that, he said, and disappeared into the crowd. The children were relieved. They didn't think, of course, that he was one of the gang. That had only been Philip's make-up. But they were worried in case he kept them talking and prevented Bill from coming up and fetching them. They stood there, under the clock, looking all round for Bill. They couldn't see anyone even remotely resembling him. Then a rather shambling, round-shouldered man came up, wearing thick glasses through which his eyes peered sharply. He wore a thick, long coat, had field glasses slung across his back, 
and a curious black-checked cap. He also had a black beard, but he spoke in Bill's voice. Good evening, children. I am glad to see you are punctual. Now, at last, we start on our little expedition. Lucianne beamed. That was Bill's nice, warm voice, all right, in spite of the beard and the strange get-up. She was just about to fling herself on him, crying, "Oh, Bill, it's good to see you." When Jack, feeling sure that Lucianne was going to do something impulsive like that, pushed her away and held out his hand politely, "Good evening, Doctor Walker. How are you?" The others took their cue from Jack. And anyone looking on would have thought that here were four children greeting a tutor or a guardian who was going to take them on a journey somewhere. Come this way," said Doctor Walker. "I have a porter for your things. Hey, porter, put these bags on your barrow, will you, and find our reservations in the ten o'clock train. Thank you." It wasn't long before they were all safely on the night train. The children were thrilled with their little bedrooms. Lucy Ann liked the way everything could fold down or fold back or be somehow pushed out of the way. Now, you must sleep all night," said Bill, his eyes smiling at them from behind his thick glasses. "Doctor Walker will see that you are awake in time for breakfast." "How do we get to the place we're going to, and where exactly is it?" asked Jack. "Well, we get there by this train and another, and then by motorboat," said Bill. The children looked thrilled. They loved travelling. I've got a map here," said Bill, making sure that the door was shut. "It's a map of all the many little islands dotted off the northwest coast of Scotland. Hundreds of them. Some are too small to map. I don't expect anyone has ever visited all of them. Only the birds live there. I thought we'd make one of them our headquarters and then cruise around a bit, taking photographs and watching the birds in their daily life." The eyes of the two boys gleamed. What a glorious thing to do! They visualized days of sunshine on the water, chugging to and from tiny islands inhabited by half-tame birds, picnicking hungrily in the breeze, sitting on rocks with their feet dangling in the clear water. Their hearts lifted in happiness at the thought. What I should really like," said Philip, "would be a tame puffin or two. I've never seen a live puffin, only a stuffed one." But they look real characters. I suppose you would teach them to sit up and beg," said Bill, amused. "Huffin and puffin," announced Kiki. "God save the Queen." Nobody took any notice. They were all too much absorbed in thinking of the unusual holiday. "I shall remain behind there once you have gone back," said Bill. "It'll be a bit lonely without you all, but no doubt you will leave me your tame puffins for company." "I shall hate leaving you." Said Lucy Ann, "Will you have to be there all alone for long, Bill? A goodish time, I expect," said Bill. "Long enough for my enemies to forget about me, or to think I'm dead and gone." "Oh dear," said Lucy Ann. "I wish you didn't have to lead such a dangerous life, Bill. Can't you do something else instead?" "What? Be a gardener or a tram conductor or something safe like that? Do you mean?" asked Bill, grinning at Lucy Ann's serious face. No, Lucy Ann, this kind of life suits me. I am on the side of law and order and right, and to my mind, they're worthwhile running any risk for. Evil is strong and powerful, but I'm strong and powerful too, and it's good to try one's strength against bad men and their ways. Well, I think you're marvelous," said Lucy Ann stoutly, "and I'm sure you'll always win. Don't you hate having to hide now?" I'm furious about it," said Bill, looking anything but furious, but with a note in his voice that made the others realize how desperate he felt, having to disappear when there was work to be done. But orders are orders, and anyway, my disappearance means a perfectly glorious holiday for all of us. Well, boys, have you finished studying that map? The two boys had been poring over the map of islands. Jack put his finger on one. Look. That sounds a good one. The Isle of Wings. It must be full of birds. We'll try and go there," said Bill. "We shall probably get well and truly lost, but never mind. Who minds being lost on the blue green sea in May time, with all kinds of little enchanted islands ready to welcome you?" "It sounds glorious," said Dinah. "Oh, look at Kiki! She's trying to pull the plug off its chain in that basin." 
Kiki had thoroughly explored the whole of the bedroom and had had a good drink out of one of the water decanters. Now she settled down on the little towel rail and, with a remarkably human yawn, put her head under her wing. At the same moment there came a loud banging of doors all down the train. She took her head out again. Shut the door, she remarked. Pop goes the door. Send for the doctor. The whistle blew, and to Kiki's alarm, the whole bedroom suddenly shook as the train pulled out of the station. She almost fell off the towel rail. Poor Kiki, what a pity, what a pity, she said, and flew to Jack's shoulder. Now it's time we all retired to bed and to sleep, said Bill, getting up. He looked very queer in his black beard and thick glasses. Thank goodness he had taken off the awful black checked cap. Do two of us sleep here, or four of us? asked Lucy Ann, looking doubtfully at the small beds, one on each side of the bedroom. Two of us, said Bill. I've got a single room on the right of you, and to the right again is another compartment, or room, for the two boys. I'm in the middle of you, you see, and you've only to bang hard on the wooden wall between us if you want anything, and I'll come rushing in. Oh, good, said Lucy Ann. I'm glad you're so near us. Bill, are you going to sleep in your beard? Well, as it's rather painful to remove at the moment, being well and truly stuck on, I think I will, said Bill. I'll take it off when we're safely among our little islands. No one will see us there. Don't you like me in my beautiful beard? Not much, said Lucy Ann. I feel as if you're not you when I look at you, but when I hear your voice, it's all right. Well, my child, look at me with your eyes shut, and you'll have no horrid feelings, said Bill with a grin. Now, good night and sleep well. Come on, boys, I'll take you to your compartment. I'll wake you in the morning. And we'll dress and go along to the restaurant car for breakfast. I feel a bit hungry now, said Philip, although we had a jolly good supper, but that's ages ago. Well, I've got some sandwiches and some bananas, said Bill. I'll get them, but don't be long turning in because it's getting late. Only just gone ten, said Dinah, but she yawned loudly as she spoke. Kiki promptly imitated her, and that set everyone else yawning too. Bill went into his own compartment and fetched sandwiches and ripe bananas. Then he said good night to the girls and took the boys to their own bedroom. It really was very exciting to go to bed in a train. It was queer undressing with the train swaying about, rushing through the night at sixty miles an hour. It was nice to be in bed, listening to the ta 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 of the train wheels turning rapidly over the rails. Travelling far, travelling far, travelling far, said the wheels to Lucy Ann as her eyes closed and her mind swung towards sleep. Travelling far. In spite of all the excitement, the four children were soon fast asleep and dreaming. What were they dreaming of? That was easy to guess. Blue green water, clear as crystal, enchanting little islands. Big white clouds flying across an enormous blue sky, and birds, 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 travelling far, travelling far, travelling far. Chapter Seven. On the sea at last. The journey was half over before the children awoke again. Bill banged on the walls, and they woke with a jump. They dressed and walked staggeringly along to the restaurant car, feeling very hungry. Lucy Ann didn't much like walking across the bits that joined two carriages together. She clutched Bill's hand. Then, I'm always afraid the train might come in too, just when I'm walking through the bit where two carriages are joined. She explained. Bill quite understood, though the others were very scornful of Lucy Ann's extraordinary idea. Kiki behaved very badly at breakfast. Throwing the toast about and squawking because she was not allowed any of the rather small helping of marmalade, she made rude noises at the sunflower seeds Jack offered her. The other passengers were amused at her and laughed, but that only made Kiki show off all the more. Stop it, Kiki," said Bill, exasperated, and tapped her smartly on the beak. Kiki screeched and made a pounce at his beard. A vicious tug, and some of it came away. Kiki hadn't been able to understand why Bill had arrived with a strange mass of hair under his chin and round his cheeks. 
Now, having got some of it, she retired under the table and began to peck it gently, separating the hairs one by one and murmuring to herself all the time. Let her be, said Bill. She'll be happy pulling that bit of my beard to pieces. He rubbed his chin. That hurt. I hope I don't look too peculiar now. Oh, no, it doesn't really show much, Jack assured him. Kiki always gets excited on a journey like this. She's awful when I bring her back from school. Whistles like the guard and tells all the people in the carriage to blow their noses and wipe their feet and screeches in the tunnels till we're almost deafened. But she's a darling, really, said Lucy Ann loyally, and didn't say a word about Kiki undoing her shoelaces and pulling them out of her shoes at that very moment. The journey was a long one. There was a change to be made at a very big and noisy station. The next train was not quite so long as the first one, and did not go so fast. It took them to a place on the coast, and the children were delighted to see the blue sea shining like a thin bright line in the distance. Hurrah! They all loved the sea. Now I feel that our holiday has really begun, said Lucy Ann. Now that we've seen the sea, I mean, it gives me a proper holiday feeling. Everyone felt the same, even Kiki. Who leapt about like a warrior doing a war dance on the luggage rack above the children's heads? She flew down to Jack's shoulder when they got out of the train at a big seaside town. The strong breeze blew in their faces, and the girl's hair streamed back. Bill's beard blew back too, and Kiki was careful to stand with her beak to the wind. She hated her feathers being ruffled the wrong way. They had a very good meal in the hotel, and then Bill went down to the harbour to see if his motorboat was there. It had just come in. The man who brought it knew Bill very well, and had been told in what disguise he was to be seen. Morning, Dr. Walker, sir, he said in loud tones. Fine weather for your expedition. Everything's ready, sir. Plenty of provisions, Henty? asked Dr. Walker, blinking through his thick glasses. Enough to stand a siege, sir, said Henty. I'm to pilot you out, sir. I've got a boat behind. Everyone went on board. It was a fine motorboat with a little cabin in front. Jack's eyes gleamed when he saw the stock of food. Tins, tins, tins. The little refrigerator was full of stuff too. Good. There would be plenty to eat anyway, and that, in Jack's opinion, was one of the main things to be planned for on a holiday. People always got so terribly hungry when they were holidaying. Henty piloted them out of the harbour. His tiny boat bobbing about. When they were beyond the harbour, Henty saluted and got into his boat. Well, good luck, sir, he said. The wireless is okay, sir. We'll be expecting a message regularly to know you're all right. There are extra batteries and a repair set as well. Good luck, sir. I'll be here in two weeks' time to pick up the kids. He rowed off, his oars making a soft plash, plash, plash in the water. He soon looked very small indeed as Bill's motorboat sped away. Well, we're off," said Bill with great satisfaction. "And my beard can come off too, and my glasses, thank goodness, and my coat. Here, Philip, you know how to steer a motorboat, don't you? Take the wheel whilst I make myself presentable again. No one is likely to see me now. Keep her going north northwest. Proudly, Philip took the wheel. The engine of the boat purred smoothly, and they sped fast over the blue water. It was a wonderful day, almost as hot as summer. The May sun shone down out of a sky flecked with tiny curly clouds, and little points of light danced on the waves. Gorgeous," said Jack, sitting down with a grunt of joy near Philip. "Simply, absolutely, perfectly gorgeous." "I've got such a lovely feeling," said Lucy Ann. Looking the picture of happiness, you know, that feeling you get at the very beginning of a lovely holiday, when all the days spread out before you, sunny and lazy and sort of enchanted. You'll end up by being a poet if you don't look out," said Philip from the wheel. "Well, if a poet feels like I feel just exactly at this moment, I wouldn't mind being one for the rest of my life, even if it meant having to write poetry," said Lucy Ann. Three blind mice, see how they run." Remarked Kiki, and for one moment everyone thought that Kiki was joining in the talk about poetry and giving what she thought was an example. 
but she was merely referring to the three tame rats that had suddenly appeared on Philip's shoulders. They stood there daintily, their pink noses raised, sniffing the salt sea air. Oh, blow you, Philip, said Dinah from her seat near Jack. I was hoping against hope you hadn't brought those detestable little creatures. I only hope the gulls eat them. But even Dinah couldn't feel annoyed for long as they glided over the green waves, leaving a white wake behind them like a long feathery tail. When Bill appeared from the little cabin, they all hailed him in delight. Bill! Dear old Bill! You look like yourself again! Oh, Bill! Never wear a beard again! It does spoil your beauty! Hurrah! We've lost Dr. Walker forever! Silly fellow! I never liked him! Bill, you look nice again. I can see your mouth when you smile. Pay the bill! Pay the bill! Shut up, Kiki, or the gulls will get you. Ah, <laughs> this is something like, said Bill happily, taking the wheel from Philip. Golly, if we get this weather, we'll all be quite sunburned in a day or two. Better keep your shirts on, boys, or you'll get blistered. Everyone had discarded coats and wraps at once. The breeze was cool, but the sun was really hot. The sea in the distance was unbelievably blue, the colour of cornflowers, Lucianne thought. Now, my friends, said Bill, his white shirt billowing in the breeze, this is a holiday, not a hair-raising adventure. You've had enough of adventures. We've had three together, and this time I want a holiday. Right, said Jack. A holiday it shall be. Adventures keep out. I don't want any adventures either, said Lucianne. I've had plenty. This is adventure enough for me. I like this kind best. Not the kind where we have to hide and creep through secret tunnels and live in caves. I just want a sunny, lazy, windy time with the people I like best. It would be nice if Aunt Allie was here too, but perhaps she wouldn't enjoy it very much. I hope she's feeling better, said Dinah. I say, where's the land? I can't see a bit, not even an island. You'll see plenty tomorrow, said Bill. You can choose one for your own. That was a wonderful afternoon and evening. They had a fine tea on board, prepared by the two girls, who found new bread, strawberry jam, and a big chocolate cake in the cabin larder. Make the most of this, said Bill. You won't get new bread often now. I doubt if we shall find any farmhouses at all among the lonely islands we shall visit. But I've brought tins and tins of biscuits of all kinds. And as for this chocolate cake, eat it up and enjoy it. I don't think you'll get any more for two weeks. I don't care, said Dinah, munching away. When I'm hungry, I simply don't mind what I eat, and I can see I'm always going to be hungry on this holiday. The sun went down in a great golden blaze, and the tiny curly clouds turned a brilliant pink. Still the motorboat went on and on and on, over a sea that blazed pink and gold too. The sun has drowned itself in the sea said Lucianne at last, as it disappeared. I watched the very, very last little bit go down into the water. Where are we going to sleep tonight? asked Jack. Not that I mind, but it would be fun to know. There are two tents somewhere in the bow, said Bill. I thought, when we came to an island we liked the look of, we'd land, put up the tents and sleep there for the night. What do you say? Oh, yes, said everyone. Let's look for an island, a really nice wild one. But at the moment, there was no land in sight, not even a small rocky island. Bill gave the wheel to Jack and looked at the chart. He pointed with his finger. We've been running in this direction. We should come on these two islands presently. One has a few people on it, and I believe a tiny jetty. We'd better go there tonight and then set off to the unknown tomorrow. It's getting too late to go hunting for islands further away. It will be dark before we got there. It's still very light, said Philip, looking at his watch. At home it would be getting dark. The further north you go, the longer the evening light is, said Bill. Don't ask me why at the moment. I don't feel capable of a lecture just now. You don't need to tell us, said Philip loftily. We learnt all about it last term. You see, owing to the sun being... Spare me, spare me, begged Bill, taking the wheel again. Look, one of your inquisitive little rats is sniffing at Kiki's tail. There will be murder done in a moment if you don't remove him. 
but Kiki knew better than to hurt any of Philip's pets. She contented herself with cracking her beak so loudly in Squeaker's ear that he ran back to Philip in alarm, scampering up his bare legs and into his shorts in a trice. Gradually, the sea lost its blue and became grey-green. The breeze felt cold, and everyone put on jerseys. Then, far away in the distance, a dark hump loomed up. Land! That's it. That's one of the islands we want for tonight, said Bill, pleased. I consider I've done pretty well to head so straight for it. We'll soon be there. It certainly was not long before they were nosing alongside a simple stone jetty. A fisherman was there in a long blue jersey. He was astonished to see them. Bill explained in a few words. Oh, so it's birds you're after, said the fisherman. Well, there's plenty for you out yon. And he nodded towards the sea. Where'll you be sleeping the night? My bit cottage would take so many. Lucy Ann couldn't understand him, but the others gathered what he meant. Bring the tents, ordered Bill. We'll soon have them up. We'll ask the fisherman's wife to give us a meal. It'll save our own provisions. Maybe we can get some cream, too, and good butter. By the time that darkness came at last, they had all had a good meal and were bedded down in the two tents, comfortable on ground sheets and rugs. The fresh air had made them so sleepy that the girls fell asleep without even saying good night. They're a daft, said the fisherman to his wife. We in a fine boat like yon, looking for birds. Birds? When there's good fish to be got? Well, they'll soon see birds in plenty. Och, they're a dafties. Chapter 8 The Island of Birds Next day, after a fine breakfast of porridge and cream and grilled herrings, the tents were struck and the five went aboard their boat. It was called Lucky Star, which the children thought was a very nice name. Kiki had not been popular with the old fisherman and his wife. They had never seen a parrot before, and they regarded Kiki with suspicion. God save the king, said Kiki, having learnt by experience that most people thought this was a fine thing for her to say. But she spoilt it by adding, Pop goes the queen, pop, pop, pop. Now she was aboard with the others, and once again the boat was skimming over the blue water. Once again the sky was blue and the sun was hot. True May weather that made the sea a clear, translucent blue and set thousands of little sparkles dancing over the water. I've still got that lovely feeling, said Lucy Ann happily as she dangled her hand over the side of the boat and felt the cool, silky water catch hold of her fingers and trail them back. Now to find some bird islands... We really are going to find some today, aren't we, Bill? We certainly are, said Bill, and gave the boat a little extra speed. Spray came up and fell lightly over everyone. Oh, lovely, said Dinah. I was so hot. That cooled me beautifully. Let her out again, Bill. I could do with some more of that. For five hours they sped over the water, and then Jack gave a shout. The islands! Look! You can see little blobs here and there on the horizon. They must be the islands. And now the children began to see a great many different birds on the water and in the air. Jack called out their names excitedly. There's a shearwater. Jolly good name for it. And look, Philip, that's a razorbill. And gosh, is that a little orc? The boys, well versed in the appearance of the wild seabirds, almost fell overboard in their excitement. Many of the birds seemed to have no fear of the noisy boat at all, but went bobbing on their way, hardly bothering to swerve when it neared them. There's a shag diving, shouted Jack. Look, you can see it swimming under water. It's caught a fish. Here it comes. It's clumsy getting out of the water to fly. Gosh, if only I'd got my camera ready. Kiki watched the many birds out of baleful eyes. She did not like the interest that Jack suddenly appeared to take in these other birds. When a great gull appeared, flying leisurely right over the boat, Kiki shot up underneath it, gave a fearful screech, and turned a somersault in the air. The gull, startled, rose vertically on its strong wings and let out an alarmed cry. <coughs> Kiki imitated it perfectly, and the gull, 
thinking that Kiki must be some strange kind of relation, circled round. Then it made a pounce at the parrot, but Kiki flipped round and then dropped to Jack's shoulder. Here, she called defiantly, and the gull, after a doubtful glance, went on its way, wondering, no doubt, what kind of a gull this was that behaved in such a peculiar manner. You're an idiot, Kiki, said Jack. One of these days a gull will eat you for his dinner. Poor old Kiki, said the parrot, and gave a realistic groan. Bill laughed. I can't imagine what Kiki will do when we see the puffins waddling about among the heather and sea pinks, he said. I'm afraid she will give them an awful time. As they came nearer to the first island, more and more birds were to be seen on and above the water. They glided gracefully on the wind. They dived down for fish. They bobbed along like toy ducks. There was a chorus of different cries, some shrill, some guttural, some mournful and forlorn. They gave the children a wild, exultant kind of feeling. As they came near to the island, the children fell silent. A tall cliff towered in front of them, and it was covered from top to bottom with birds. The children stared in delight. Birds, birds, birds! On every ledge they stood or squatted, thousands of white gannets, myriads of the browner guillemots, and a mixture of other seabirds that the boys could hardly make out, though they glued their field glasses to their eyes for minutes on end. What a coming and going! said Bill, staring with fascinated eyes too. And it certainly was. Besides the birds that stood on the ledges, there were always others arriving and others leaving. That way and this went the busy birds with a chorus of excited cries. They're not very careful with their eggs, said Lucy Ann in distress when she looked through Jack's glasses in her turn. The careless birds took off and knocked their precious eggs over the ledge and down the cliff to be smashed on the rocks below. They can lay plenty more, said Jack. Come on, Lucy Ann, give me back my glasses. Golly, what a wonderful sight! I shall write this all up in my notes tonight. The motorboat nosed carefully round the rocky cliffs. Bill stopped looking at the birds and kept a sharp lookout instead for rocks. Once round the steep cliffs, the land sloped downwards, and Bill spotted a place that seemed suitable for the boat. It was a little sheltered sandy cove. He ran the boat in and it grounded softly. He sprang out with the boys and made it safe by running the anchor well up the beach and digging it in. Is this going to be our headquarters? asked Dinah, looking round. Oh, no, said Jack at once. We want to cruise round a bit, don't we, Bill, and find a puffin island. I'd really like to be in the midst of the bird islands and be able to go from one to the other as we pleased. But we could stay here for tonight, couldn't we? That was a wonderful day for the four children, and for Bill, too, with thousands of birds screaming round their heads, but apparently not in the least afraid of them. The children made their way to the steep cliffs they had seen from the other side of the island. Birds were nesting on the ground, and it was difficult to tread sometimes without disturbing sitting birds or squashing eggs. Some of the birds made vicious jabs at the children's legs, but nobody was touched. It was just a threatening gesture, nothing more. Kiki was rather silent. She sat on Jack's shoulder, her head hunched into her neck. So many birds at once seemed to overwhelm her. But Jack knew that she would soon recover and startle the surrounding birds by telling them to wipe their feet and shut the door. They reached the top of the cliffs and were almost deafened by the cries and calls around them. Birds rose and fell in the air, glided and soared, weaving endless patterns in the blue sky. It's funny they never bump into one another, said Lucy Ann, astonished. There's never a single collision. I've been watching. Probably got a traffic policeman, said Philip solemnly. For all you know, some of them may have licenses under their wings. Don't be silly, said Lucy Ann. All the same, it is clever of them not to collide when there's so many thousands. What a row! I can hardly hear myself speak. They came to the very edge of the cliff. Bill took Lucy Ann's arm. Not too near, he said. The cliffs are almost sheer here. They were. When the children lay down on their tummies and looked cautiously over, it gave them a queer feeling to see the sea so very, very far below, moving slowly in and out, 
with only a far-off rumble to mark the breaking of the waves. Lucianne found herself clutching the cushions of sea pink beside her. I somehow feel I'm not safe on the ground, she said with a laugh. I feel as if I've got to hold on. I feel sort of, well, sort of upside down. Bill held on to her tightly after that speech. He knew that she felt giddy, and he wasn't going to risk anything with little Lucy Ann. He liked all the children very much, but Lucy Ann was his favourite. The children watched the birds going and coming endlessly to and from the narrow cliff ledges. It was a marvellous sight. Jack looked through his glasses and chuckled at the squabbling and pushing that was going on on some of the narrower shelves. Just like naughty children, he said, telling each other to move up and make room or I'll push you off. And off somebody goes, sure enough. But it doesn't matter because out go their wings and they have a lovely glide through the air. My word! I wouldn't mind being a seabird, able to stride along on the seashore, or bob on the sea, or dive for fish, or glide for miles on the strong breeze. I shouldn't mind being. What's that? Said Philip suddenly, hearing a noise that wasn't made by seabirds. Listen, an aeroplane, surely. They all listened, straining their eyes through the sun-washed air, and far away, they saw a speck. Steadily moving through the sky, and heard the roar of an engine. A plane, right off all the routes," said Bill. "Well, that's the last thing I expected to see here." Chapter Nine. Hurrah for Puffin Island! Bill seemed so astonished that the children stared at him. Surely it wasn't so surprising to see an aeroplane even near these desolate bird islands. Bill took Jack's glasses and looked through them, but it was too late to make out anything. I wonder if it was a sea plane or an ordinary plane," he said, half to himself. "How strange! Why is it strange?" asked Dinah. "Aeroplanes go everywhere now." Bill said no more. He handed back the glasses to Jack. I think we'd better have a meal and then put up our tents," he said. "What about putting them by that little stream we saw on our way here, about a quarter of a mile from the shore? It wouldn't be too far to carry everything if we all give a hand." The tents were set up, the ground sheets were put down, and the rugs tumbled over them. Then, sitting on a slight slope, looking out to the blue sea, the five of them had a glorious meal. "I always think," began Lucianne. Munching a couple of biscuits with butter and cream cheese between them, I always think you needn't go on," said Jack. "We know what you're going to say, and we quite agree with you." "You don't know what I'm going to say," said Lucianne indignantly. "We do," said Philip. "You say it every holiday when we have a meal out of doors." "You're going to say, I always think food tastes much nicer when it's eaten out of doors," said Dinah. "Aren't you?" Well, I was," said Lucianne. "Do I really always say it? Anyway, it's quite true. I do think. Yes, we know," said Jack. "You're an awful repeater, Lucianne. You tell us the same things over and over again. Never mind. We think the same, even if we don't keep on saying it. Kiki, take your fat beak out of the cream cheese. Kiki's awful," said Dinah. "She really is." She's pinched three biscuits already. I don't think you give her enough sunflower seeds, Jack. Golly, I like that," said Jack. She won't even look at sunflower seeds when there's a spread like this. Anyway, Philip, your rats can always eat them. I found Squeaker in my pocket a little while ago, nibbling one of them as fast as he could. I hope it won't make him ill," said Philip in alarm. I say, look, here comes a gull, tame as anything. It wants a biscuit too, I should think. It did. It had watched Kiki pecking at a biscuit and enjoying it, and it didn't see why it shouldn't have a share. Kiki saw the gull out of the corner of her eye and sidled away. The gull made a pounce, got the biscuit, and rose into the air, making a loud laughing noise. <coughs> Kiki flew up angrily, calling out all kinds of things to the gull. They were meant to be very rude. But unfortunately, the gull didn't understand. Kiki could not catch the strong-winged bird, 
and flew disconsolately back to the children. You can't complain, Kiki, said Jack. You shouldn't have pinched that biscuit out of the tin, and the gulls shouldn't have pinched it from you. It's six of one and half a dozen of the other. What a pity, what a pity, said Kiki, and sidled near the biscuit tin again. That bird is a real clown, said Bill, shaking the crumbs off his jersey. Now, who's coming back to the boat with me to hear the news on the radio? Also, I must send out a few messages, especially one for your mother, Philip, who will be sure to want to know if we've got here safely. They all wanted to stretch their legs, so they walked back over the soft cushions of the sea pinks, whose bold little pink heads nodded everywhere in the wind. They watched Bill as he put up his little radio mast and fiddled about with the set. It was a transmitter as well as a receiver. I suppose if you send messages home every night, we shan't need to post letters off to Aunt Allie, said Lucy Ann. Everyone roared. And where would you post a letter, pray? asked Jack. I haven't seen a pillar box anywhere about. <laughs> Lucy Ann, you're an idiot. Yes, I am, said Lucy Ann, going red. Of course we can't post anything here. How useful that you can send messages, Bill. Then if any of us wanted help, you could get it. Quite so, said Bill. But I hope if you wanted help, I could whiz you off in the motorboat. Anyway, I wouldn't have consented to bring you all the way into the wilds like this if I hadn't a transmitter with me, so that I could send messages every night. I send them to headquarters, and they telephone them to your aunt, so she'll follow our travels and adventures each night. They watched for a while, and then listened to part of the program. Then Lucy Ann yawned, and Kiki imitated her. Blow, you make me feel sleepy, said Dinah, rubbing her eyes. Look, it's getting dark. So back they went to their tents, and were soon cuddled into their rugs. The birds called incessantly from the cliffs and the sea. I believe they keep awake all night, thought Dinah. But they didn't. They slept too when the darkness came at last. The next day was very warm and close. Looks to me like a storm blowing up sooner or later, said Bill, screwing up his eyes and looking into the bright sky. I almost think we'd better try and find our headquarters today, so that we have some shelter if a storm does blow up. This sort of holiday needs fine weather if it's going to be successful. A storm wouldn't be at all pleasant, with only tents to sleep in. We'd be blown to bits. I just want to take a few photographs of these cliffs and the birds on them, said Jack. I'll do that whilst you're getting down the tents. If you don't mind my not helping you. So off he went with Kiki towards the steep cliffs. Bill called after him that he was not to try any climbing down the cliffs, and he shouted back that he wouldn't. Soon everything was packed away again on the motorboat, which was just being floated by the rising tide, and they waited patiently for Jack. He soon appeared, his glasses and his camera slung round his neck, and his face beaming. Got some beauties, he said. Kiki was awfully useful to me. I got her to parade up and down so that all the birds stayed still in amazement watching her. And then, click, I got them beautifully. I ought to have some fine pictures. Good, said Bill, smiling at the enthusiastic boy. You'll have to have a book of bird photographs published. Masterpieces by Jack Trent. Price thirty shillings. I'd like that, said Jack, his face shining. Not the thirty shillings, I mean, but having a book about birds with my name on it. Come on in, said Philip impatiently, for Jack was still outside the boat. We want to be off. It's so warm I'm longing to get out to sea again and feel the breeze on my face as the boat swings along. They soon felt it and were glad of it. It certainly was very hot for May. The boat went swiftly through the water, bobbing a little as it rowed over the waves. Lucy Ann let her fingers run through the water again, lovely and cool. What I should like is a bathe, said Philip, little drops of perspiration appearing round his nose. Can we bathe from the boat, Bill? Wait till we get to another island, said Bill. I don't particularly want to stop out at sea with a storm in the offing. It's so jolly hot I feel there must be thunder about. I'm anxious to run for shelter before it comes. Now, here are more islands bobbing up out of the sea. Let's see if we can spot a puffin island. That's what you want, isn't it? Lucy Ann, still dangling her hand in the water, 
suddenly felt something gently touching it. In surprise, she looked down, withdrawing her hand at once, afraid of a jellyfish. To her astonishment, she saw that it was a piece of orange peel bobbing away on the waves. She called to Bill. Bill, look! There's a bit of orange peel. Now, whoever in the world eats oranges in these wild little islands? Do you suppose there are any other bird lovers somewhere about? Everyone looked at the tiny bit of orange peel bobbing rapidly away. It did seem very much out of place there. Bill stared at it hard. He was puzzled. The fishermen, if there were any on the islands they were coming to, would not be at all likely to have oranges. A naturalist surely would not bother to load themselves up with them. Then how did that bit of peel come to be there? No ships went anywhere near where they were. It was a wild and lonely part of the sea where sudden storms blew up and great gales made enormous waves. Beats me, said Bill at last. I shall expect to see a pineapple or something next. Now look, here is an island, fairly flattish, probably has puffins on it all right. Shall we make for it? No, cruise round a bit, begged Jack. Let's have a look at a few of the islands here. There is quite a colony of them round about. They cruised round, looking at first this island and then that. They came to one that had steep cliffs at the east side, then ran down into a kind of valley, then up again into cliffs. Jack put his glasses to his eyes and yelled out excitedly, Puffins! Plenty of them! Can you see them, Philip? I bet the island is full of their burrows. Let's land here, Bill. There'll be masses of birds on the cliffs and hundreds of puffins in land. It's quite a big island. We could probably find good shelter here and water, too. The cliffs would protect us from both the east and west. What ho for Puffin Island! Right, said Bill. He looked all round and about and guided the boat towards the island. There were many other islands not far off, but as far as he could see they were inhabited only by birds. The sea chopped about between the islands, making little rippling waves. Round Puffin Island went the boat, and Philip gave a shout. Here's a fine place to put the boat in, Bill. See, where that channel of water goes into a cleft of the cliff. It'll be deep there, and we can just tie the boat up to a rock. We'll put out the fenders so that she doesn't bump against the rock sides. The boat nosed into the channel. As Philip said, the water was deep there. It was a natural little harbour. There was a ledge of rock on which they could land. Could anything be better? Hurrah for Puffin Island! Chapter 10 A Little Exploring Isn't this a gorgeous place? said Jack, as the boat glided gently into the little channel. There was just room for it. It might be a boathouse made specially for the lucky star. Bill leapt out onto the rocky ledge, which did very well for a landing stage. Sheer above them on each side rose rocky cliffs. Rows and rows of birds sat on the ledges, and there was a continual dropping of eggs, knocked off by the careless birds. One broke near Bill and splashed its yellow yoke over his foot. Good shot! he yelled up to the circling birds, and the children roared. They made the boat fast by tying the mooring rope round a convenient rock. The boat bobbed up and down gently as waves ran up the little channel and back. Tide's up now, said Bill. When it goes down, there will still be plenty of water in this channel. The boat will look much lower down then. Now, is there a way up the cliff from here? We don't want to have to walk down the ledge and clamber round the cliffs over hundreds of rocks before we get onto the island proper. They looked round. Jack ran up the rocky ledge, and then turned and gave a shout. Hi! We can get up here, I think. There are rocky shelves like rough steps going up the cliff, and there's a break in it a bit above. We could probably clamber out all right, and find ourselves right on the island. Well, you four go and explore, said Bill. I'd better stay with the boat and see that she doesn't get her side smashed in against these rocks. You look round the island and see if you can spot a sheltered cove somewhere that I can take the boat round to. The children left the boat and followed Jack. Kiki flew on ahead, calling like a gull. Up the rocky ledges went Jack. They were almost like giant steps, 
roughly hewn by the great wintry seas for century after century. As Jack said, the cliff had a deep cleft in it just there, and the children found that they could make their way through it and come out onto the cushions of sea pinks beyond. It needed a bit of clambering, and they were out of breath when they reached the top, but it was worth it. The sea spread bright blue all round the island. The sky looked enormous. Other islands, blue in the distance, loomed up everywhere. A real colony of them, it seemed, and their island was in the centre. Then Jack gave such a yell that everyone jumped. Puffins! Look! Hundreds and hundreds of them! The children looked to where Jack pointed, and there, among the sea pinks and the old heather tufts, were the most curious looking birds they had ever seen. They were dressed in black and white. Their legs were orange, but it was their extraordinary bills that held the children's attention. Look at their beaks! cried Dinah, laughing. Blue at the base, and then striped red and yellow. But what enormous beaks! cried Lucy Ann. They remind me a bit of Kiki's. Puffins are called sea parrots, remarked Jack, amused to see the crowd of solemn looking puffins. Their eyes are so comical, said Philip. They stare at us with such a fixed expression, and look at the way they walk, so upright. The colony of puffins was as good as a pantomime to watch. There were hundreds, thousands of birds there. Some stood about, watching, their crimson ringed eyes fixed seriously on their neighbours. Others walked about, rolling from side to side like a sailor. Some took off like small aeroplanes, eager to get to the sea. Look, what's that one doing? asked Lucy Ann, as a puffin began to scrape vigorously at the soil, sending a shower of it backwards. It's digging a burrow, I should think, said Dinah. They nest underground, don't they, Jack? Rather. I bet this island is almost undermined with their holes and burrows, said Jack, walking forward towards the colony of busy birds. Come on, do let's get near to them. Kiki, keep on my shoulder. I won't have you screaming like a railway engine at them and scaring them all away. Kiki was most interested in the comical puffins. She imitated their call exactly. Ah! <coughs> They said in deep guttural voices. Ah! Answered Kiki at once, and various birds looked up at her inquiringly. To the children's huge delight, the puffins were not in the least afraid of them. They did not even walk away when the children went near. They allowed them to walk among them, and although one aimed a peck at Philip's leg when he stumbled and almost fell on top of it, not one of the others attempted to jab with their great beaks. This is lovely, said Lucy Ann, standing and gazing at the extraordinary birds. Simply lovely. I never thought birds could be so tame. They're not exactly tame, said Jack. They're wild, but they are so little used to human beings that they have no fear of us at all. The puffins were all among the cushions of bright sea pinks. As the children walked along, their feet sometimes sank right down through the soil. The burrows were just below. And their weight caused the earth to give way. It's absolutely mined with their burrows, said Philip. And I say, it's not a very nice smell just about here, is it? It certainly wasn't. They soon got used to it, but they didn't like it. Pooh, said Lucy Ann, wrinkling up her nose. It's getting worse and worse. I vote we don't put our tents up too near this colony of puffins. It's as bad as being near a pigsty. I don't mind it," said Jack. "Hey, come here, Kiki." But Kiki had flown down to make friends. The puffins gazed at her fixedly and solemnly. "Ah," said Kiki politely. "Ah, God save the Queen." "Ah," replied a puffin and walked up to Kiki, rolling from side to side like a small sailor. The two looked at one another. I shall expect Kiki to say how do you do in a minute," said Dinah with a little squeal of laughter. "They both look so polite." Polly, put the kettle on," said Kiki. "Ah," said the puffin and waddled off to its hole. Kiki followed, but apparently there was another puffin down the hole who did not want Kiki's company, for there was soon an agonised squeal from the parrot, who shot out of the hole much more rapidly than she had gone in. 
she flew up to Jack's shoulder. Poor Kiki, what a pity, what a pity, what a pity. Well, you shouldn't poke your nose in everywhere, said Jack, and took a step forward. He trod on a tuft of sea pinks, which immediately gave way, and he found his leg going down into quite a deep burrow. Whoever lived in it didn't like his leg at all, and gave a vicious nip. Oh, said Jack, sitting down suddenly and rubbing his leg. Oh, look at that! Nearly had a bit right out of my calf! They went on through the amazing puffin colony. There were puffins on the ground, in the air, and on the sea, too. <coughs> Their deep calls sounded everywhere. I'll be able to take some magnificent photographs, said Jack happily. It's a pity it's too early for young ones to be about. I don't expect there are many puffin eggs yet, either. The puffins were living mainly in the green valley between the two high cliffs. Philip looked about to see if there was any good place to pitch their tents. I suppose we all want to make Puffin Island our headquarters, he said. I imagine that nothing will drag Jack away from here now. He's got cliffs where guillemots and gannets nest, and a valley where the puffins live, so I suppose he's happy. Oh, yes, said Jack. We'll stay here. This shall be our island. We'll share it with the puffins. Well, we'll find a good place for our tents. Said Philip. Then we'll bring our goods and chattels here and camp. We'd better find a place where there's a stream, though. If there is one on this island, we shall want water to drink. And let's look for cover where we can put the boat. We can't very well leave it in that narrow channel. Look, there's a dear little cove down there, said Dinah suddenly, pointing to the sea. We could bathe there, and the boat would be quite all right there, too. Let's go and tell Bill. I'll go, said Philip. Jack wants to stare at the puffins a bit more, I can see. I'll take the boat round to the cove with Bill, and you two girls can find a good place for our tents. Then we'll all help to bring the things there from the boat. He ran off quickly to find Bill and tell him where to put the boat. Jack sat down with Kiki to watch the puffins. The girls went to look for a good place to put up their tents for the night. They wandered over the island. Beyond the puffin colony, Just at the end of it, before they came to the high cliffs at the other side of the island, was a little dell. A few stunted birch trees grew there, and banks of heather. This is just the place, said Dinah, pleased. We can put up our tents here, be sheltered from the worst of the wind, watch the puffins, go down to bathe when we want to, and when we're tired of that, go cruising round the other islands. A very nice life, said Lucianne with a laugh. Now, Is there any water about? There was no stream at all on the island, but Dinah found something that would do equally well. At least, she hoped it would. Look here, she called to Lucy Ann. Here's an enormous rock with a hollow in its middle, filled with water. I've tasted it, and it isn't salt. Lucy Ann came up, followed by Jack. Dinah dipped in her hand, scooped up a palmful of water, and drank. It was as sweet and as pure as could be. Rainwater, said Dinah, pleased. Now we'll be all right, so long as it doesn't dry up in this hot weather. Come on, let's go back to the boat and collect all the things we want. We'll have to do a bit of hard work now. We'll wait here a bit, said Jack, coming up with Kiki. I expect Bill and Philip will be bringing the boat round to the cove over there. Then we'll go and tell them we've found a good place and help to bring the things here. It was not long before Bill and Philip ran into the cove with the boat. Bill leapt out, took the anchor well up the beach, and dug it in. He saw Jack and the girls and waved to them. Just coming, he cried. Have you found a good place for the tents? He and Philip soon joined the others and were pleased with the little dell. Just right, said Bill. Well, we'll bring all the things we want from the boat straight away now. So they spent quite a time going to and from the cove, laden with goods. It did not take quite as long as they feared, because there were five of them to do it, and even Kiki gave a hand, or rather a beak, and carried a tent peg. She did it really to impress the watching puffins, who stared at her seriously as she flew by, the peg in her big curved beak. Ah! she called in a puffin voice. You're showing off, Kiki, said Jack severely. You're a conceited bird. Ah! 
said Kiki, and dropped the tent peg on Jack's head. It was fun arranging their new home. The boys and Bill were to have one tent. The girls were to have the other. Behind the tents, Lucianne found a ledge of rock, and below it was a very large, dry space. Just the spot for storing everything in, said Lucianne proudly. Jack, bring the tins here and the extra clothes. There's room for heaps of things. Oh, we are going to have a lovely time here. Chapter Eleven. Huffin and Puffin. Isn't it time we had a meal? Complained Jack, staggering over with a great pile of things in his arms. It makes my mouth water to read spam and best tinned peaches and see that milk chocolate. Bill looked at his watch and then at the sun. My word, it certainly is time. The sun is setting already. How the time has flown! It wasn't long before they were all sitting peacefully on tufts of sea pink and heather, munching biscuits and potted meat, and looking forward to a plate of tinned peaches each. Bill had brought bottles of ginger beer from the boat, and these were voted better than boiling a kettle to make tea or cocoa. It was very warm indeed. I feel so happy," said Lucianne, looking over the island to the deep blue sea beyond. I feel so very, very far away from everywhere. Honestly, I hardly believe there is such a thing as school just at this very minute, and this potted meat tastes heavenly. Philip's white rats also thought it did. They came out from his clothes at once when they smelt the food. One sat daintily upright on his knee, nibbling. Another took his titbit into a dark pocket. The third perched on Philip's shoulder. "You tickled the lobe of my ear," said Philip. Dinah moved as far from him as she could, but like Lucianne, she was too happy to find fault with anything just then. They all ate hungrily. Bill too, their eyes fixed on the setting sun and the gold-splashed sea, which was now losing its blue and taking on sunset colours. Lucianne glanced at Bill. "Do you like disappearing, Bill?" she asked. "Don't you think it's fun?" "Well." For a fortnight, yes," said Bill. "But I'm not looking forward to living in these wild islands all alone. Once you've gone, it's not my idea of fun. I'd rather live dangerously than like one of these puffins here." "Poor Bill," said Dinah, thinking of him left by himself with only books to read and the radio and nobody to talk to. "I'll leave you my rats if you like," offered Philip generously. "No thanks," said Bill promptly. I know your rats; they'd have umpteen babies, and by the time I left, this would be Rat Island, not Puffin Island. Besides, I'm not so much in love with the rat and mouse tribe as you are. Oh, look! Do look! Suddenly said Dinah. Everyone looked. A puffin had left its nearby burrow and was walking solemnly towards them, rolling a little from side to side, as all the puffins did when they walked. It's come for its supper. Then sing, Puffin, sing," commanded Jack. "Sing for your supper." "Ah," said the Puffin deeply. Everyone laughed. The Puffin advanced right up to Philip. It stood close against the boy's knee and looked at him fixedly. "Philip's spell is working again," said Lucianne enviously. "Philip, what makes all animals and birds want you to be friends with them? Just look at that Puffin." It's going all goofy over you. Don't know," said Philip, pleased with his odd new friend. He stroked the bird's head softly, and the puffin gave a little "ah" of pleasure. Then Philip gave it a bit of potted meat sandwich, and the bird tossed it off at once and turned for more. Now I suppose you'll be followed round by a devoted puffin," said Dinah. Well, a puffin is better than three rats any day, or mice. Or that awful hedgehog with fleas that you had, or that pair of stag beetles, or spare us, Dinah, spare us," begged Bill. "We all know that Philip is a walking zoo. Personally, if he likes a goofy puffin, he can have it. I don't mind it a bit. It's a pity we haven't brought a collar and lead." The puffin said "ah" again, a little more loudly, and then walked off, perfectly upright, 
its brilliant beak gleaming in the setting sun. Well, you didn't pay us a very long visit, old thing, said Philip, quite disappointed. The puffin disappeared into its burrow, but reappeared again almost immediately with another puffin, a little smaller, but with an even more brilliant beak. Darby and Joan, said Jack. The two birds waddled side by side to Philip. The children looked at them in delighted amusement. What shall we call them? said Dinah. If they are going to join our little company, they'll have to have names. Funny little puffins. Huffin and puffin, huffin and puffin, remarked Kiki, remembering the words suddenly. Huffin and? Yes, of course. Huffin and puffin, cried Lucy Ann in delight. Clever old bird, Kiki. You've been talking about huffin and puffin ever since we started out on our holiday. And here they are, huffin and puffin, as large as life. Everyone laughed. Huffin and Puffin did seem to be perfectly lovely names for the two birds. They came close to Philip, and, to the boy's amusement, squatted down by him contentedly. Kiki was not too pleased. She eyed them with her head on one side. They stared back at her with their crimson ringed eyes. Kiki looked away and yawned. They've outstared Kiki, said Jack. It takes a lot to do that. The three rats had prudently decided that it was best to keep as far away from Huffin and Puffin as possible. They sat round Philip's neck, gazing down at the two birds. Then, at a movement from Huffin, they shot down the boy's shirt. Bill stretched himself. Well, I don't know about you kids, but I'm tired, he said. The sun is already dipping itself into the west. Let's clear up and turn in. We'll have a lovely day tomorrow. Bathing and sunning ourselves and watching the birds. I'm getting used to their eternal chorus of cries now. At first, I was almost deafened. The girls cleared up. Lucy Ann dipped a bowl into the clear pool of water and handed it round for washing in. We oughtn't to wash in that pool, ought we, Bill? she said seriously. Good gracious, no, said Bill. It would be absolutely black after the boys had gone in. We'll keep it for drinking water only. Or just take our water from it when we want it for boiling or washing. I think I'll go and have a dip now, said Jack, getting up. No, not in the rock pool, Lucy Ann, so don't look so upset. I'll go down to the little cove where the boat is. Coming, Philip. Right, said Philip, and pushed Huffin and Puffin away from his knees. Move up, you. I'm not growing here. I'll come too, said Bill, and knocked out the pipe he had been smoking. I feel dirty. You girls want to come? No, said Lucy Ann. I'll get the rugs and things ready for you in the tents. Dinah didn't want to go either, for she felt very tired. Measles had certainly taken some of the energy out of the two girls. They stayed behind whilst the others set off to the cove to bathe. The valley sloped right down to the sea just there, and the small sandy cove was just right for bathing. The boys and Bill threw off their things and plunged into the sea. It felt lovely and warm and rippled over their limbs like silk. Lovely, said Bill, and began to chase the boys. With howls and yells and splashings they eluded him, making such a terrific noise that Huffin and Puffin, who had solemnly accompanied Philip all the way, half walking and half flying, retreated a little way up the beach. They stared at the boys fixedly and thoughtfully. Philip saw them and was pleased. Surely nobody had ever had two puffins for pets before. The girls were setting out ground sheets and rugs neatly in the two tents when Dinah suddenly stopped and listened. Lucy Ann listened too. What is it? she whispered. And then she heard the noise herself. An aeroplane again, surely. The girls went out of the tent and looked all over the sky, trying to locate the sound. There, there, look, cried Lucy Ann excitedly, and she pointed westwards. Can't you see it? Oh, Dinah, what's it doing? Dinah couldn't spot the plane. She tried and tried, but she could not see the point in the sky where the aeroplane flew. Something's falling out of it, said Lucy Ann, straining her eyes. Oh, where are the boys' field glasses? Quick, get them, Dinah. Dinah couldn't find them. Lucy Ann stood watching the sky, her eyes screwed up. 
Something dropped slowly from it, she said. Something white. I saw it. Whatever could it have been? I hope the aeroplane wasn't in any trouble. Bill will know, said Dinah. I expect he and the boys saw it all right. Maybe they took the glasses with them. I couldn't find them anywhere. Soon there was no more to be seen or heard of the plane, and the girls went on with their work. The tents looked very comfortable with the piles of rugs. It was such a hot night that Dinah fastened the tent flaps right back in order to get some air. That storm doesn't seem to have come, she said, looking at the western sky to see if any big clouds were sweeping up. But it feels very thundery. Here are the others, said Lucy Ann, as she saw Jack, Philip, and Bill coming up from the shore. And Huffin and Puffin are still with them. Oh, Di, won't it be fun if we have two pet puffins? I wouldn't mind puffins, said Dinah. But I can't bear those rats. Hello, Bill. Did you hear the aeroplane? Good gracious, no. Was there one? demanded Bill with great interest. Where? How was it we didn't hear it? We were making such a row, said Jack, grinning. We shouldn't have heard a hundred aeroplanes. It was funny, said Lucy Ann to Bill. I was watching the aeroplane when I saw something falling out of it, something white. Bill stared, frowning intently. A parachute, he said. Could you see? No, it was too far away, said Lucy Ann. It might have been a parachute. Or a puff of smoke, I don't know. But it did look as if something was falling slowly from the plane. Why do you look so serious, Bill? Because I have a feeling there's something, well, just a bit strange about these planes, said Bill. I think I'll pop down to the motorboat and send a message through on the radio. Maybe it's nothing at all, but it just might be important. Chapter Twelve. Bill goes off on his own. Bill went off down the valley to the cove where the motorboat was moored. His feet sank deeply into the soft earth. The children stared after him. Lucy looked solemn, as solemn as Huffin and Puffin, who were leaning against Philip, standing upright, their big beaks looking heavy and clumsy. Oh dear, what does Bill mean? Surely we're not going to tumble into an adventure again, up here, where there's nothing but the sea, the wind, and the birds. What could happen? I wonder. Well, Bill isn't likely to tell us much," said Philip. "So don't bother him with questions. I'm going to turn in. Oh, it's getting a bit cold now. Me for that big pile of rugs. Huffin and Puffin, you'd better keep outside for the night." There'll be little enough room in this tent for you as well as us three, Kiki and the rats. Huffin and Puffin looked at one another. Then, with one accord, they began to scrape the earth just outside the tent, sending the soil up behind them. Lucy Ann giggled. They're going to make a burrow as near you as possible, Philip. Oh, aren't they funny? Kiki walked round to examine what the two puffins were doing. She got a shower of earth all over her and was very indignant. She growled, and the two puffins agreed politely. Bill came back in about half an hour. All the children were cuddled up in their rugs, and Lucy Ann was asleep. Dinah called out to him, "Everything all right, Bill?" "Yes, I got a message from London to tell me that your mother is getting on as well as can be expected," said Bill. "But she's got measles pretty badly, apparently. Good thing you're all off her hands." What about your own message, Bill? About the aeroplane," said Dinah, who was very curious over Bill's great interest in it. "Did that get through?" "Yes," said Bill shortly. "It did. It's nothing to worry your head about. Good night, Dinah." In two minutes' time, everyone was asleep. Squeaker and his relations were only to be seen as bumps about Philip's person. Kiki was sitting on Jack's tummy. Though he had already pushed her off several times, Huffin and Puffin were squatting in their new-made tunnel, their big coloured beaks touching. Everything was very peaceful as the moon slid across the sky, making a silvery path on the restless waters. The morning dawned bright and beautiful, 
and it seemed as if the storm was not coming, for there was no longer any closeness in the air. Instead, it was fresh and invigorating. The children ran down to the shore to bathe as soon as they got up. They ran so fast that Huffin and Puffin could not keep up, but had to fly. They went into the water with the children and bobbed up and down, looking quite ridiculous. Then they dived for fish, swimming with their wings under the water. They were very quick indeed, and soon came up with fish in their enormous beaks. What about giving us one for breakfast, Huffin? Called Philip and tried to take a fish from the nearest puffin's beak, but it held onto it and then swallowed it whole. You ought to teach them to catch fish for us," said Jack, giggling. "We could have grilled fish for breakfast then." Hey, get away, puffin! That's my foot, not a fish. At breakfast, they discussed their plans for the day. What shall we do? Let's explore the whole island and give bits of it proper names. This glen, where we are now, is Sleepy Hollow because it's where we sleep," said Lucy Ann. "And the shore where we bathe is Splash Cove," said Dinah. "And where we first moored our motorboat is Hidden Harbour." Bill had been rather silent at breakfast. Jack turned to him. "Bill, what do you want to do? Will you come and explore the island with us?" "Well," said Bill, very surprisingly. If you don't mind, as you'll be very busy and happy on your own, I'll take the motorboat and go cruising about a bit, round all these islands, you know. What? Without us? Said Dinah in astonishment. We'll come with you then, if you want to do that. I'm going alone this first time, said Bill. Take you another time, old thing, but today I'll go alone. Is there, is there anything up? Asked Jack, feeling that something wasn't quite right. Has something happened, Bill? Not that I know of," said Bill cheerfully. "I just want to go off on my own a bit. That's all. And if I do a bit of exploring round on my own account, I shall know the best places to take you to, shan't I?" "All right, Bill," said Jack, still puzzled. "You do what you want. It's your holiday too, even if it is a disappearing one." So Bill went off on his own that day. And the children heard the purr of the motorboat as it went out to sea, and then set off apparently to explore all the islands round about. Bill's up to something," said Philip, "and I bet it's to do with those aeroplanes. I wish he'd tell us, but he never will talk. I hope he comes back safely," said Lucy Ann anxiously. "It would be awful to be stranded here on a bird island and nobody knowing where we were." "Gosh, so it would," said Jack. I never thought of that. Cheer up, Lucy Ann. Bill isn't likely to run into danger. He's got his head screwed on all right. The day passed happily. The children went to the cliffs and watched the great companies of seabirds there. They sat down in the midst of the puffin colony and watched the colourful, big-beaked birds going about their daily business. Lucy Ann wore a hanky tied round her nose. She couldn't bear the smell of the colony. But the others soon got used to the heavy sourness of the air, and anyway, the wind blew strongly. Huffin and Puffin did not leave them; they walked or ran with the children. They flew round them, and they went to bathe with them. Kiki was half jealous, but having had one hard jab from Huffin's multicolored beak, she kept at a safe distance and contented herself with making rude remarks. "Blow your nose! How many times have I told you to wipe your feet?" You bad boy, huffin and puffin all the time. Pop goes huffin. The children sat in Sleepy Hollow after their tea and watched for Bill to come back. The sun began to set. Lucy Ann looked pale and worried. Where was Bill? He'll be along soon. Don't worry," said Philip. "We'll hear his boat presently." But the sun went right down into the sea, and still there was no Bill. The darkness closed down on the island, and there was no longer any point in sitting up and waiting. It was four anxious children who went into their tents and lay down to sleep, but none of them could sleep a wink. In the end, the girls went into the boys' tent and sat there talking. Then suddenly they heard a welcome sound. They all leapt up at once and rushed from the tent. That's Bill. It must be. Where's the torch? 
Come on down the cove. They stumbled through the puffin colony, waking up many a furious bird. They got to the beach just as Bill came walking up. They flung themselves on him in delight. Bill, dear Bill, what happened to you? We honestly thought you'd got lost. Oh, Bill, we shan't let you go off alone again. Sorry to have worried you so," said Bill. "But I didn't want to return in the daylight in case I was spotted by an aeroplane. I had to wait till it was dark, though I knew you'd be worried. Still, here I am." But Bill, aren't you going to tell us anything? cried Dinah. Why didn't you want to come back in daylight? Who would see you, and why would it matter? Well," said Bill slowly. There's something peculiar going on up here in these lonely waters. I don't know quite what. I'd like to find out. I didn't see a soul today anywhere, though I nosed round umpteen islands. Not that I really expected to, because nobody would be fool enough to come up here for something secret and let anything of it be seen. Still, I thought I might find some sign. I suppose that bit of orange peel was a sign that someone's here besides ourselves on some other island," said Lucy Ann, remembering the piece that had bobbed against her fingers. But what are they doing? Surely they can't do much in this desolate stretch of waters with nothing but islands of birds around. That's what I'm puzzled about," said Bill. "Can't be smuggling because the coasts of the mainland are very well patrolled at the moment, and nothing could get through." Then what is it, Bill? You're sure nobody saw you? Asked Dinah anxiously. There might be hidden watchers on one of the islands, you know, and one might see you without you seeing him. That's true," said Bill. But I had to risk that. It's not very likely, though. The risk of anyone coming to these islands and disturbing whatever secret game is going on is very remote, and I don't think there would be sentinels posted anywhere. Still. You might have been seen or heard," persisted Dinah. "Oh, Bill, and you were supposed to be disappearing completely. Now perhaps your enemies have spotted you." "They would hardly be the same enemies that I've disappeared from," said Bill with a laugh. "I don't think anyone else would recognize me here, seen at a distance in a motorboat. In any case, they would just think I was a birdman or a naturalist of some kind who likes the solitude of these seas." They were soon back in their tents again, happy to have Bill with them in safety. The stars shone down from a clear sky. Huffin and Puffin shuffled down their burrow, glad that their new family had gone to rest. They did not approve of these night walks. Lucy Ann lay and worried. I can feel an adventure coming. It's on the way. Oh dear! And I did think this would be the very, very last place for one. Lucy Ann was quite right. An adventure was on the way, and had very nearly arrived. Chapter Thirteen. What happened in the night? The next morning, everything seemed all right. The children had forgotten their fears of the night before, and Bill joked and laughed as merrily as the others. But all the same, he was worried. And when an aeroplane appeared and flew two or three times over the islands, he made the children lie down flat in the middle of the puffin colony where they happened to be at that moment. I don't think our tents can be seen," he said. "I hope not, anyway." "Don't want anyone to know we're here, Bill?" asked Jack. "No," said Bill shortly. "Not at present, anyway. If you hear a plane, bob down, and we won't light a fire to boil a kettle." We'll have ginger beer or lemonade instead. The day passed happily enough. It was very hot again, and the children went to bathe half a dozen times, lying in the sun to dry afterwards. Kiki was jealous of Huffin and Puffin because they could go into the water with the children. She stood on the sandy beach, her toes sinking in, shouting loudly, "Polly's got a cold. Send for the doctor." Achoo! Isn't she an idiot? Said Jack and splashed her. She was most annoyed and walked a bit farther back. Poor Kiki, what a pity! Poor Pity, what a Kiki! Yes, what a Kiki! Shouted Jack 
and dived under the water to catch Bill's legs. They took a good many photographs, and Huffin and Puffin posed beautifully, staring straight at the camera in a most solemn manner. I almost feel they'll suddenly put their arms round one another," said Jack as he clicked the camera. "Thank you, Huffin and Puffin. Very nice indeed. But I wish you'd smile next time. Kiki, get out of the way, and leave that tent peg alone. You've already pulled up three. That night, the sky was full of clouds, and the sun could not be seen. Looks as if that storm might be coming soon," said Bill. "I wonder if our tents will be all right." Well, there's nowhere else to go," said Jack. "Sleepy Hollow is about the most sheltered place on this island, and as far as I've seen, there are no caves or anything of that sort. Perhaps the storm will blow over," said Philip. "Phew! It's hot. I really think I must have one last bathe." "You've had eight already today," said Dinah. "I counted." Darkness came earlier that night because of the clouds. The children got into their rugs, yawning. I think," said Bill, looking at the luminous face of his wristwatch. "I think I'll slip along to the boat and send a message or two on my transmitter. I might get some news too for myself. You go to sleep. I shan't be long." "Right," said the boys sleepily. Bill slipped out of the tent. The girls were already asleep and did not hear him go. Philip fell asleep almost before Bill was out of the tent. Jack lay awake a few minutes longer and pushed Kiki off his middle for the fifth time. She went and stood on Philip's middle and waited for a lump to come near her feet, which she knew would be one of the tame rats. When one did venture near, raising a little mound under the rug, Kiki gave a sharp jab at it. Philip awoke with a yell. "You beast, Kiki! Jack, take her away!" She's given me an awful peck in my middle. If I could see her, I'd smack her on the beak. Kiki retired outside the tent till the boys were asleep again. She flew to the top of it and perched there, wide awake. Meanwhile, Bill was in the cabin of the boat, tuning in on the radio. But because of the coming storm, it was difficult to hear anything but atmospherics. Blow," said Bill at last. "I shan't get my messages through at this rate." I have a good mind to take the boat to the little channel. What is it the children call it? Hidden Harbor. Maybe I could get the radio going better there. It's so sheltered. It was very important to Bill to be able to use the radio that night. He set the engine of the boat going and was soon on his way to Hidden Harbor. He nosed in carefully and moored the boat. Then he set to work on his radio again. After a while. He thought he heard some noise out to sea, a noise getting nearer and nearer. Bill turned off his radio and listened, but the wind was getting up, and he heard nothing but that. He tuned the knobs again, listening intently for any message. He had got one through, and now he had been told to stand by and wait for an important announcement from headquarters. The radio fizzed and groaned and whistled. Bill waited patiently, then. Suddenly, hearing a sound, he looked up, startled, half expecting to see one of the boys coming down into the cabin, but it wasn't. It was a hard-faced man with a curious, crooked nose who was staring down at him. As Bill turned and showed his face, the man uttered a cry of the utmost astonishment. "You! What are you doing here? What do you know of?" Bill leapt up, but at the same moment. The man lunged out at him with a thick, fat, knobbly stick he held in his hand, and poor Bill went down like a ninepin. He struck his head against the edge of the radio and slid to the floor. His eyes closed. The man with the crooked nose whistled loudly. Another man came to the small cabin and looked in. "See that," said the first man, pointing to Bill. "Bit of a surprise, eh, to find him up here? Do you suppose he guessed anything?" Must have if he's here," said the second man, who had a short, thick beard hiding a very cruel mouth. "Tie him up. He'll be useful. We'll make him talk." Bill was tied up like a trussed chicken. He did not open his eyes. The men carried him out and took him into a small boat moored beside the Lucky Star. It was a rowing boat. 
Into it went poor Bill, and the men undid their rope, ready to row back to their own motorboat, which lay perfectly silent a little way beyond the island. Do you suppose there's anyone else with him? asked the man with the crooked nose. There was no one on board but him. No. When his boat was sighted yesterday, we only saw one man aboard, and it was him all right, said the man with the beard. If there'd been anyone else, we'd have seen him. He's all alone. <laughs> he didn't know he was being watched all the way back here last night. I suppose there really isn't anyone else here, said the first man, who seemed very reluctant to go. And we better smash up the boat, just in case. All right. And the radio, too, said the man with the beard. He found a hammer, and soon there were crashing sounds as the engine of the motorboat was damaged and the beautiful little radio was smashed to bits. Then the men set off in their rowing boat with the unconscious Bill. They reached their motorboat, and soon the purring of its engine getting fainter and fainter sounded in the night. But nobody on Puffin Island heard it except Kiki and the seabirds. The children had no idea at all that Bill had not returned that night. They slept peacefully, hour after hour, dreaming of huffins and puffins, big waves and golden sands. Jack awoke first. Kiki was nibbling at his ear. Blow you, Kiki, said Jack, pushing the parrot away. Oh, goodness, here's huffin and puffin, too. So they were. They waddled over to Philip and stood patiently by his sleeping face. Ah, said Huffin lovingly. Philip awoke. He saw Huffin and Puffin and grinned. He sat up and yawned. Oh, hello, Jack, he said. Bill up already? Looks like it, said Jack. Probably gone to bathe. He might have waked us up, though. Come on, let's wake the girls and go and bathe, too. Soon all four were speeding to the sea, expecting to see Bill in the water. But he wasn't. Where is he, then? said Lucianne, puzzled. And good gracious, where's the boat? Yes, where was the boat? There was no sign of it, of course. The children stared at the cove, puzzled and dismayed. He must have taken it round to Hidden Harbour, said Jack. Perhaps the radio wouldn't work or something. It still feels stormy, and that might have upset it. Well, let's go to Hidden Harbour, then, said Philip. Perhaps Bill got sleepy down there in the boat and thought he'd snuggle up in the cabin. He's probably there, said Dinah. Fast asleep, too. Let's go and give him a shock. We'll halloo down into the cabin and make him jump, the sleepy head. Oh, I do hope he's there, said Lucy Ann, shivering as much with worry as with cold. They dressed quickly, shivering a little, for the sun was hidden behind angry-looking clouds. I do hope the weather isn't going to break up, just as we've begun such a lovely holiday, said Dinah. Oh, Huffin, I'm sorry, but you got right under my feet. Did I knock you over? The Puffin didn't seem to mind having Dinah tread on it. It shook out its wings, said, Arr! and hurried on after Puffin, who was trying to keep pace with Philip. They went across the Puffin colony and came to the cleft in the cliffs. There, below them, lay the motorboat, swaying very gently as waves ran up under her and then ran back again. There she is, said Dinah in delight. Bill did take her round to the harbour. He's not on deck, said Jack. He must be in the cabin. Come on. Let's call him, said Lucy Ann suddenly. Do let's. I want to know if he's there. And before the others could stop her, she shouted at the top of her voice, Bill! Oh, Bill! Are you there? No Bill came out from the cabin, and for the first time a little uneasiness crept into the children's minds. Bill! yelled Jack, making everyone jump violently. Bill! Come on out! No sound from the boat. Suddenly panic-stricken, all four children stumbled down the rocky ledge to the boat. They jumped on board and peered down into the little cabin. He's not there, said Dinah, scared. Well, where is he then? He must be somewhere about, as the boat is still here, said Jack sensibly. 
He'll come along soon. Maybe he's exploring somewhere on the island. They were just turning away when Philip caught sight of something. He stopped and clutched Jack, turning very pale. What? said Jack, frightened. What's up? Silently, Philip pointed to the radio. Smashed, he said in a whisper. Smashed to bits. Who did it? Lucy Ann began to cry. Jack went up on deck and had a look round, feeling sick and upset. Then Philip gave an anguished howl from the cabin that sent the others running to his side. Look, the engine of the boat is smashed up too, absolutely destroyed. My goodness, what's been happening here? And where is Bill? Said Dinah in a husky whisper. Gone, kidnapped," said Philip slowly. "Someone came for him in the night. They don't know we're here, I suppose. They just thought Bill was alone. They've got him, and now we're prisoners on Puffin Island, and we can't get away." Chapter Fourteen. A few plans. Everyone felt suddenly sick. Lucy Ann sat down in a heap. Dinah joined her. The boys stood staring at the smashed engine as if they couldn't believe their eyes. It must be a nightmare," said Dinah at last. "It can't be true. Why, why everything was right as rain last night, and now, now the boat smashed up so that we can't get away. The radio is smashed so that we can't get a message through, and Bill's gone," said Philip. And it isn't a dream; it's real. Let's sit down in the cabin all together," said Lucy Ann, wiping her eyes. "Let's sit close and talk. Let's not leave each other at all." Poor Lucy Ann," said Philip, putting his arm round her as she sat down unsteadily. "Don't worry; we've been in worse fixes than this." "We haven't," said Dinah. "This is the worst fix we've ever been in." Kiki felt the tenseness of all the children. She sat quietly on Jack's shoulder, making little comforting noises. Huffin and Puffin sat solemnly on the deck, staring fixedly in front of them. Even they seemed to feel that something awful had happened. In the cabin, sitting close together, the children felt a little better. Jack rummaged in a tiny cupboard beside him and brought out some bars of chocolate. The children had had no breakfast. And although the shock they had had seemed to have taken their appetites away, they thankfully took the chocolate to nibble. Let's try and think out carefully exactly what must have happened," said Jack, giving a bit of his chocolate to Kiki. "Well, we know that Bill was worried about something," said Philip. "Those planes, for instance. He felt certain something peculiar was going on up here, and that's why he went out by himself in the boat. He must have been seen. Yes." And maybe in some way his enemies got to know he was here," said Dinah. "They could have followed him a long way back, using field glasses to keep him in sight. Anyway, it's quite clear that they came looking for him here, and found him," said Jack. "What a pity he went off to tinker with the radio last night. Well, if he hadn't, the enemy, whoever they are, would probably have searched the island and found us too," said Dinah. "As it is." They probably don't know we're here. It wouldn't matter if they did know," said Lucy Ann. "They'd be quite sure we couldn't do any harm living on an island we can't get off." They got here in a motorboat, probably," went on Jack. "Left the motorboat out beyond somewhere and slipped in shore quietly in a rowing boat. They must know this little channel, or maybe they saw a light from the boat. Bill would be sure to have the cabin light on, and it's a pretty bright one." Yes, and they surprised him and knocked him out. I suppose," said Philip gloomily. "They've taken him away. Goodness knows what'll happen to him. They won't. They they won't hurt him, will they?" said Lucy Ann in a rather trembly voice. Nobody answered. "Cheer up, Lucy Ann," said Philip. "We've been in worse scrapes before. Whatever Dinah says, we'll get out of this one all right." How? Asked Lucy Ann, "I don't see how we can. You don't either." Philip didn't. He scratched his head and looked at Jack. 
Well, we've got to make some kind of plan, said Jack. I mean, we must make up our minds what we are going to do to try and escape, and what we are going to do till we escape. Won't Bill's friends come and look for us when they don't get Bill's messages through? asked Dinah suddenly. Pooh! What would be the good of that? said Philip at once. There are hundreds of these little bird islands here. It might take years visiting and exploring every single one to find us. We could light a fire on the cliff and keep it burning so that any searcher could see the smoke in the daytime and the flames at night, said Dinah excitedly. You know, like shipwrecked sailors do. Yes, we could, said Jack. Only the enemy might see it too and come along and find us before anyone else does. There was a silence. Nobody knew who the enemy were. They seemed mysterious and powerful and frightening. Well, I can't help it. I think we ought to follow Dinah's plan and light a fire, said Philip at last. We've got to run the risk of the enemy seeing it and coming to find us, but we simply must do something to help anyone searching for us. We can keep a lookout for the enemy and hide if they come. Hide? Where can we hide? asked Dinah scornfully. There isn't a single place on this island for anyone to hide. No, that's true, said Jack. No caves, no trees, except for those few little birches, and the cliffs too steep to explore. We really are in a fix. Can't we do anything to help Bill? asked Lucy Ann dolefully. I keep on and on thinking of him. So do I, said Jack. But I don't see that we can do much to help ourselves, let alone Bill. Now, if we could escape from here, or radio for help and get some of Bill's friends along, it would be something. But there doesn't seem anything at all to do except stay here and wait. There's plenty of food anyway, said Dinah. Stacks of tin stuff, and biscuits, and potted meat, and Nestle's milk and sardines. I think we'd better strip the boat of them, said Jack. I'm surprised the enemy didn't take what they could with them. Maybe they'll come back for them. So we'll take them first. We can hide them down some of the puffin burrows. Let's have a bit of breakfast now, said Philip, feeling better now that they had all talked the matter over and made a few plans. Open some tins and get some ginger beer. Come on. They all felt better still when they had had something to eat and drink. They had put a cover over the poor smashed radio. They couldn't bear to look at it. Jack went up on deck when they had finished their meal. It was very close again, and even the wind seemed warm. The sun shone through a thin veiling of cloud and had a reddish hue. That storm is still about, said Jack. Come on, everyone, let's get to work before it comes. It was decided that Philip and Dinah should hunt for driftwood to make a fire up on the cliff. We don't know that those aeroplanes we sometimes see belong to the enemy, said Philip. If they don't, they may see our signal and come to circle round. Then they will send help. One might come today even. So we'll get a fire alight. We'll bank it with dry seaweed. That will smolder well and send up plenty of smoke. Jack and Lucy Ann were to carry things from the boat to the tents in Sleepy Hollow. Take all the tins and food you can, said Philip. If the enemy happened to come back at night and take it, we'd be done. We should starve. As it is, we've got heaps to last us for weeks. The four children worked very hard indeed. Jack and Lucy Ann carried sacks of tins from the boat to Sleepy Hollow. For the time being, they bundled them in a heap by the tents. Kiki examined them with interest and pecked at one or two. It's a good thing your beak isn't a tin opener, Kiki, said Jack, making the first little joke that day to try and make Lucy Ann smile. We shouldn't have much food left if it was. Philip and Dinah were also very busy. They took a sack each from the boat and wandered along the shore to pick up bits of wood. They found plenty at the tide line and filled their sacks. Then they dragged them to the top of the cliff. Huffin and Puffin went with them, solemn as ever, sometimes walking, sometimes flying. Philip emptied his sack of wood on a good spot. He began to build a fire. Dinah went off to fill her sack with dry seaweed. There was plenty. Soon, Jack and Lucy Ann, emptying their own sacks in Sleepy Hollow, 
saw a spiral of smoke rising up from the cliff top. Look, said Jack, they've got it going already. Good work. The wind bent the smoke over towards the east. It was good, thick smoke, and the children felt sure that it could be seen from quite a distance. One of us had always better be up here, feeding the fire and keeping watch for enemies or friends, said Philip. How shall we know which they are? asked Dinah, throwing a stick on the fire. Well, I suppose we shan't know, said Philip. What we'd better do if we see any boat coming is to hide. That is, if we can find anywhere to hide, and then try and discover if the searchers are enemies or friends. We are sure to hear them talking. We'd better get lots more wood dye. This fire will simply eat it up. Lucy Ann and Jack helped them when they had finished their own job. We've taken every single tin and every scrap of food out of the boat, said Lucy Ann. We really have got plenty to eat, and that rock pool to drink from when we finish the ginger beer. There aren't an awful lot of bottles left now. Wouldn't you like to have dinner soon? Yes, I'm jolly hungry, said Philip. Let's have it up here, shall we? Or is it too much bother to fetch a meal here, Lucy Ann? You see, one of us must keep the fire going all the time. Well, it won't go out for a while, anyhow, said Lucy Ann. Bank it up with some more seaweed. Honestly, we feel fagged out carrying all that stuff. Let's go to Sleepy Hollow and have a good rest and a jolly good meal. So they all returned to Sleepy Hollow, where the two tents flapped in the little breeze. They sat down, and Lucy Ann opened tins and ladled the contents onto plates. You've got tinned salmon, biscuits and butter, tinned tomatoes and tinned pears, she said. Even Huffin and Puffin came closer than usual to share such a nice meal. They would have eaten every scrap of the salmon if they could. Kiki preferred the tinned pears. But the children would only allow her one. Well, things would be a lot worse if we hadn't got all this nice food, said Jack, leaning back in the warm sun after a big meal. An adventure without good food would be awful. Kiki, take your head out of that tin. You've had more than any of us, you greedy glutton of a parrot. Chapter 15 a really terrible storm. The wind got up about five o'clock. It whipped the waves round the island until they towered into big white horses that raced up the beaches and broke with a sound of thunder. The seabirds deserted the coves and flew into the air, crying loudly. The wind took them and they soared for miles without beating a wing, enjoying themselves thoroughly. Kiki didn't like so much wind. She could not glide or soar like the gulls and guillemots. It offended her dignity to be blown about too much. So she stayed close to the tents, which flapped like live things in the wind and strained at the tent pegs violently. Look here, we can't possibly watch the fire all night, said Philip. We'll have to bank it up and hope for the best. Maybe it will send out a glow anyway. Doesn't that seaweed keep it in nicely? My goodness, the wind tears the smoke to rags now. The sun went down in a bank of angry purple clouds that gathered themselves together in the west. Jack and Philip stared at them. That's the storm coming up, all right, said Jack. Well, we've felt one coming for days. This hot weather was bound to end up like that. I hope the wind won't blow our tents away in the night. So do I, said Philip anxiously. Honestly, there's a perfect gale blowing up now. Look at those awful clouds. They look really wicked. The boys watched the clouds covering the sky, making the evening dark much sooner than usual. Philip put his hand into one of his pockets. My rats know there is a storm coming, he said. They're all huddled up in a heap together right at the very bottom of my pocket. Funny how animals know things like that. Jack, called Lucy Ann anxiously, do you think the tents are safe? The wind is blowing them like anything. The boys went to examine them. They were as well pegged as they could be, but in this gale, who knew what might happen? We just can't do anything about it but hope for the best, said Jack rather gloomily. Philip, have you got your torch? We'd better be prepared to be disturbed in the night if this gale goes on. We might have to re-peg one of the tents. Both boys had torches with new batteries, so that was all right. 
They put them down beside their beds when they cuddled up into their rugs that night. They all went early because, for one thing, it was getting very dark. For another thing, it had begun to rain heavily, and for a third thing, they were all very tired with the day's work. Kiki retired with the boys as usual, and Huffin and Puffin scuttled into their burrows nearby. Wonder what poor old Bill is doing," said Jack to Philip as they lay listening to the wind howling round them. I bet he's worried stiff about us. It's a shame, just as we were all set for a glorious holiday," said Philip. And now the weather's broken too. What on earth shall we do with ourselves if it goes on like this for days? It will be frightful. Oh, it may clear up again when the storm is over," said Jack. "Golly, hark at the waves on the beaches round the island, and how they must be dashing against those steep cliffs. I bet the Gannets and Gillamonts aren't getting much sleep tonight." The wind's pretty deafening too," said Philip. "Blow it! I feel so tired, and yet I can't possibly sleep with all this din going on. And gosh, what's that? Thunder," said Jack, sitting up. "The storm is on us now, all right. Let's go into the girls' tent, Philip. Lucy Ann will be pleased to see us if she's awake. A storm over this exposed little island won't be very funny." They crept into the other tent. The girls were wide awake and very glad to have them beside them. Dinah squeezed up into Lucy Ann's rugs, and the boys got into Dinah's warm place. Jack flashed on his torch. He saw that Lucy Ann was very white. "There's nothing to be afraid of, old thing," he said gently. "It's only a storm, and you're never frightened of those, Lucy Ann. You know you aren't." "I know," gulped Lucy Ann. "It's only that, well." The storm seems so wild and, and spiteful somehow. It tears at our tent and bellows at us. It seems alive. Jack laughed. The thunder came again and crashed more loudly than the waves on the shore. Kiki crept close to Jack. Pop, 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 she said and put her head under her wing. Thunder doesn't pop, Kiki, said Jack, trying to joke, but nobody smiled. The wind blew more wildly than ever, and the children wished they had more rugs. It was very, very draughty. Then the lightning flashed; it made them all jump, for it was so vivid. For an instant, the steep cliffs and the raging sea showed vividly. Then the picture was gone. Crash! The thunder came again, this time sounding overhead. Then the lightning split the sky open again, and once more the children saw the cliffs and the sea. They didn't seem quite real somehow. Sort of unearthly," said Philip. "Gosh, hark at the rain! I'm getting spattered all over with it. Though goodness knows how it's getting in here. The wind's getting worse," said Lucianne fearfully. "Our tents will blow away. They will. They will." "No, they won't," said Jack stoutly, taking Lucianne's cold hand in his. "They can't. They." But at that very moment, there came a rending sound—a great flap, flap, flap. Something hit Jack across the face, and their tent was gone. The four children were struck dumb for a moment. The wind howled round them. The rain soaked them. They had nothing over them to protect them. Their tent had vanished, vanished with the wild wind in the darkness of the night. Lucy Ann screamed and clutched Jack. He put his torch on quickly. Gosh, it's gone! The gale has taken it away. Come into our tent quickly! But before the children could even get up from their rugs, the gale had taken the other tent too. It rushed by Philip as he stood trying to help the girls up, and when he turned his torch to where his tent should be, there was nothing. Ours has gone too! He cried, trying to outshout the wind. Whatever are we to do? We'd better get down to the boat if we possibly can," yelled Jack. "Or do you think we shall be blown over? Had we better roll ourselves up in the ground sheets and rugs and wait till the storm has blown itself out? No, we'll be soaked. Better try for the boat," said Philip. He dragged the girls up. Each of the children wrapped a rug round their shoulders to try and ward off the rain and the cold. "Take hands and keep together," yelled Philip. I'll go first. They took hands. Philip set off, staggering in the gale that was blowing in his face. 
Through the puffin colony he went, trying to keep on his feet. Suddenly Dinah, who had hold of Philip's hand, felt him drag it away. Then she heard a cry. She called in fright. Philip! Philip! What's happened? There was no answer. Jack and Lucy Ann came close to Dinah. What's up? Where's Philip? Jack's torch shone out in front of them. There was no Philip there. He had vanished completely. The children, their hearts beating painfully, stayed absolutely still in dismay and astonishment. Surely the gale hadn't blown him away. Philip! Philip! yelled Jack, but only the wind answered him. Then all three yelled at the tops of their voices. Jack thought he heard a faint answering cry. But where? It sounded at his feet. He swung his torch downwards, and to his immense surprise and fright, he saw Philip's head, but only his head, on a level with the ground. Dinah shrieked in fright. Jack knelt down, too dumbfounded to say a word. Just Philip's head. Just Philip's. Then he saw in a flash what had happened. Philip had trodden on soil so undermined by the puffins that it had given way, and he had fallen right through to a hole below. Jack could have cried with relief. Are you all right, Philip? he yelled. Yes, give me your torch. I've dropped mine. I've fallen through into a whopping big hole. There might be room for us all to shelter here for a bit, shouted back Philip, the words being whipped away by the wind almost before Jack could hear them. Jack gave Philip his torch. The boy's head disappeared. Then it came back again, looking very odd sticking up between some heather and a sea pink cushion. Yes, it's an enormous hole. Can you all get down? We'd keep safe and dry here till the storm is over. Come on, it's a bit smelly, but otherwise not bad. Dinah slid through the opening of the hole and found herself beside Philip. Then came Lucy Ann and then Jack. Jack had found Philip's torch, and the two torches were now shone around the hole. I suppose the rabbits and the puffins together managed to burrow so much that they've made an enormous hole, said Jack. Look, there's a puffin burrow leading out of it over there, and one of the puffins staring in astonishment at us. Hello, old son. Sorry to burst in on you like this. The relief of finding that Philip was safe, and of being out of the wild noise of the storm, made Jack feel quite light-headed. Lucy Ann's shivers stopped, and they all looked round them with interest. I should think this was a natural cavity of some sort, said Philip, with a layer of good soil held together by roots and things making a surface above. But all that burrowing by the puffins made it give way when I trod on it, and down I fell. Well, it's just what we wanted for the moment. Above them, deadened by tangled heather and sea pinks, the storm raged on. No rain came into the cavity. The thunder sounded very far away. The lightning could not be seen. I don't see why we shouldn't sleep here for the night, said Jack, spreading out the rug he had taken from his shoulders. The soil is dry and soft, and the air must be good enough because that puffin is still there, gazing at us. I say, I hope Huffin and Puffin are all right. They all spread out their rugs and lay down, cuddled up together. Oh, congratulations on finding us such a fine home for tonight, Philip, said Jack sleepily. Very clever of you indeed. Good night, everybody. Chapter 16 Next Day They all slept soundly in their unexpected shelter. They did not awake until late in the morning, because for one thing it was dark in the hole and for another they had all been tired out. Jack awoke first, feeling Kiki stirring against his neck. He could not think where he was. A little daylight filtered through the entrance of the hole, but not much. It was very warm. Arrgh, said a guttural voice, and made Jack jump. Arrgh. It was the puffin which had come down its burrow to see them the night before. Jack switched on his torch and grinned at it. Good morning, if it is morning. Sorry to have disturbed you. I'll get Huffin and Puffin to explain to you when we see them again. Philip woke and sat up. Then the girls stirred. 
Soon they were all wide awake, looking round the curious cavity and remembering the events of the night before. What a night! said Dinah, shuddering. Oh, when our tents blew away, I really did feel awful. And when Philip disappeared, I felt worse, said Lucy Ann. What time is it, Jack? Jack looked at his watch and whistled. My word! It's almost ten o'clock! How we've slept! Come on, let's see if the storm is still going strong. He stood up and pulled away the overhanging heather that blocked up the narrow entrance to the hole. At once a shaft of blinding sunlight entered, and the children blinked. Jack put his head out of the hole in delight. Golly! It's a perfect day! The sky is blue again, and there's sunshine everywhere. Not a sign of the storm left. Come on, let's go up into the sunlight and have a look around. Up they went, giving each other a hand. Once they were out of the hole, and the heather fell back into place again, there was no sign of where they had spent the night. Wouldn't it make an absolutely marvellous hiding place? said Jack. The others looked at him, the same thought occurring to everyone at once. Yes, and if the enemy come, that's where we'll go, said Dinah. Unless they actually walk over the place, they can't possibly find it. Why, I don't know myself where it is now, though I've just come out of it. Gosh, don't say we've lost it as soon as we've found it, said Jack, and they looked about for the entrance. Jack found it in just the same way as Philip had the night before, by falling down it. He set an upright stick beside it so that they would know the entrance easily next time. We might have to sleep down there each night now as our tents have gone, said Jack. It's a pity we brought our rugs up. Still, they can do with the sunning. We'll spread them out on the heather. Thank goodness that awful wind's gone, said Dinah. There's hardly even a breeze today. It's going to be frightfully hot. We'll bathe. They had a dip in the quiet sea, which looked quite different from the boiling, raging sea of the day before. Now it was calm and blue, and ran up the sand in frilly little waves edged with white. After their bathe, the children had an enormous breakfast in the spot where their tents had been. Huffin and Puffin appeared as soon as the children arrived and greeted them joyfully. Arr, arr. They're saying that they hope we've got a good breakfast for them, said Dinah. Huffin and Puffin, I wish you'd eat rats. You'd be very useful then. Philip's rats had appeared again now that the storm was over, much to Dinah's disgust. They seemed very lively, and one went into Jack's pockets to find a sunflower seed. It brought one out, sat on Jack's knee, and began to nibble it. But Kiki pounced at once and snatched the seed away whilst Squeaker scurried back to Philip in a hurry. You're a dog in the manger, Kiki, said Jack. You don't really want that sunflower seed yourself, and you won't let Squeaker have it either. Fie! Fie fo fum, said Kiki promptly, and went off into a screech of laughter right in Jack's ear. He pushed her off his shoulder. I shall be deaf for the rest of the day. Lucy Ann, look out for that potted meat. Huffin is much too interested in it. Really? What with Kiki pinching fruit out of the tin, and Huffin and Puffin wanting the potted meat, and Philip's rat sniffing round, it's a wonder we've got anything ourselves, said Lucy Ann. But all the same, it was fun to have the creatures joining in and being one with them. Huffin and Puffin were especially comical that morning, for now that they were really friendly, they wanted to look into everything. Huffin suddenly took an interest in Dinah's fork and picked it up with his beak. Oh, don't swallow that, silly! cried Dinah, and tried to get her fork away. But Huffin had a very strong beak, and he won the tug of war. He waddled away to examine the fork in peace. He won't swallow it, don't worry, said Philip, tossing Dinah his own fork. It'll keep him quiet a bit if he plays with it for a while. The children's fire was, of course, completely out. It had to be pulled to pieces and lighted all over again. This was not so easy as before, because everything had been soaked during the night. Still, the sun was so very hot that it wouldn't be long before the wood and the seaweed were bone dry again. The children missed out dinner completely that day, because it had been twelve o'clock before they had cleared up their breakfast things. We'll have a kind of high tea about five, said Jack. We've plenty to do. Look for our tents, light the fire, 
Find some more wood, and go and see if the motor boat is all right. Their tents were nowhere to be seen. One or two pegs were found, but that was all. The tents are probably lying on some island miles and miles away," said Jack, scaring the seabirds there. Well, shall we sleep in that hole tonight? Oh no! Please don't let's," begged Lucianne. "It's smelly, and it's sleep tough." Chapter Twenty One. Horace does not like Puffin Island. If you ask me, he's having a nice lazy time snoozing on deck with his radio playing him nice tunes," whispered back Philip. "Look, can you see that little glow, Jack? I bet that's the end of a cigarette the guard is smoking. Yes, it probably is," said Jack. "I don't think we dare go in any closer," said Philip. "We don't want to be seen. If the guard gives the alarm, we're done for. I wonder how many there are on the deck." I can only see one glowing cigarette end. What are you going to do? Whispered Lucianne. Do do something. I feel awful. I shall burst in a minute. Philip put out his hand and took hers. Don't worry, he whispered. We shall have to do something soon. It looks to be rather a good time. If only that guard would fall asleep. I say, Tufty, do you know what I think would be much the best thing to do? Said Jack suddenly, "If you and I swam to the harbour, climbed up, got on the boat, and surprised the guard, we could probably tip him into the water, and before he could raise the alarm, we'd open up the hatch and get Bill out. Why, we could probably drive the motor boat off too. Then we'd have two. Sounds a good plan," said Philip. "But we don't know yet if Bill is there, and it's quite likely we couldn't tip the guard overboard, especially if there are more than one. We'd better do a little exploring first. Your idea of slipping overboard and swimming to the harbour is jolly good, though. We'll certainly do that. We can clamber up a part where there are shadows, away from that light. Oh dear, must you go swimming in the dark? Said Lucianne, looking at the black water with a shiver. I should hate it. Do, do be careful, Jack. I'll be all right, said Jack. Come on, Philip, strip off your clothes. We'll swim in our pants. It wasn't long before the boys silently slid overboard and entered the water. It was cold, and they drew their breaths in sharply. But they soon felt warm as they swam rapidly towards the harbour. They could hear the radio more plainly as they came near. Good thing, thought Jack. They won't be able to hear us coming at all. They avoided the light and clambered up the part of the jetty where there were black shadows. It was not easy. The boat's just there. Whispered Jack in Philip's ear, "Not right under the light, thank goodness." A sound made them stop suddenly. A loud and prolonged yawn came from the deck of the boat. Then the radio was snapped off, and silence came back to the night. "He may be going to sleep," hissed Jack. "Let's wait." They waited in complete silence for about ten minutes. The man tossed a glowing cigarette end overboard, but did not light another. The boys heard him give several grunts as if he was settling down comfortably. Then he gave a loud yawn again. Still, the boys waited, shivering in the darkness of the jetty, keeping close to one another in order to get a little bit of warmth from each other's bodies. Then, on the night air, came very, very welcome sounds. He's snoring," whispered Jack, pressing Philip's arm in joy. "He's asleep." I'm sure there's only one guard, because otherwise they would have been talking together. Now's our chance. Come on, but quietly, so as not to wake him. The two boys, shivering now with excitement as much as with cold, crept along the jetty to the boat. They climbed cautiously on board, their bare feet making no sound at all. On the deck lay the sleeping guard, if he was a guard. Then another sound stopped, sprang up on shore, and voices began to shout. There came the sound of running feet. Overboard then! His breath and wished the motorboat would go a little faster. Rrrr, went the engine steadily, and the boat motorboat chasing them switched on a powerful searchlight. It swept the sea all round. We're just out of reach," said Bill thankfully. "This little boat can certainly get a move on. Just fears hurt." 